belong. A place to forge their future. Because while many doors open, these doors transform. They did for us. Support your local boys and girls clubs. Great futures start here. Thank you. Um, I want to do a brief announcement and then we'll um, <clears throat> get into our business. Um, per the order of the city manager, no member of the public will be permitted to attend this meeting in person. Uh, the city of Boulder has canceled all board and commission meetings and has also closed all city build buildings and facilities to the public effective March 15 through March 29. The city will continue to provide essential city services to the community, including public safety, water utilities, and emergency response services. This meeting is being broadcast and televised on Boulder uh, Channel 8 and live streamed on boulderchannel8.com. I want to explain why um, Sam Weaver and Rachel Friend are not in the room. They both decided um, for uh, health and safety reasons to uh, not uh, be physically present. Um, Tonight they're on the phone and we're going to take up a measure right now, item 2A, relating to um, the, the uh, ability and emergency situation of council members to dial in to council meetings. Tom, do you want to walk us through um, or, uh, item 2A, ordinance 8391? Sure, Bob. Uh, the the uh, city has a code for... Um, code provisions relating to emergencies. Um, there's a section 2-2.5-11 that deals with local and special procedures for governing body meetings and departments, which basically allowed for meetings outside the city. Uh, it did not allow for any kind of meeting remotely. So we've proposed an amendment to the section adding a new subsection G, which now had, would, subsection G would itself have seven subsections, and I'll just walk through them really quickly and what they do. Subsection one would allow for city council members to attend city council meetings uh, remotely. Uh, this would only apply in the case of a, an emergency caused by a contagious disease. Um, Section subsection two would allow board or commission members the same rights. Uh, in both cases, the public has to have the ability to uh, participate in the meetings for the for those for the council to be able to participate remotely. Subsection three uh, allows for exclusion of the public from meetings in circ circumstances such as this when there's an emergency caused by contagious disease. Uh, subsection four allows for the city manager to cancel any meeting. Uh, subsection five. Uh, provides for waiver of procedural rules. Uh, as you know, the boards and commissions have timelines, such as a landmarks board hearing that has to be approved within 60 days. Uh, if there's no meeting, uh, we could end up either denying or approving something that without deliberation. The subsection 5 gives the city manager the authority to uh, suspend all of those deadlines and then reschedule things. Uh, sub subsection 6, um, allows for uh, changing timelines and deadlines based for permits, contracts, and licenses. And subsection 7 um, allows for uh, changing in procedural requirements for development review applications. Um, so basically, these are all authorities that are added to the emergency powers of the city manager during a disaster emergency. Although when I wrote this, the city had not declared a disaster emergency, but the, the state had. So it provides for either a disaster emergency based on a contagious disease, either just declared by the governor or by the city manager. Uh, so it would cover either. In this case, we have both. Great. Uh, questions for Tom? Anybody have any questions? Okay. Entertain a motion to, Bob, yeah. May I add, I, on your dais, and I posted on hotline, there are uh, some amendments that basically are included in the overview that I just gave you. Um, that is, they would allow for the, the changing of deadlines for permits, and it also allows for the city manager to, for, for the situation where we have already gone through, say, the publication notice for a certain type of permit of application, 
we wouldn't have to redo that notice as long as the hearing was rescheduled in accordance with the notice requirements under the Colorado Opens Records Act. So we wouldn't have to go through the republication requirements. Those would have been satisfied. Um, this, this change, this amendment, would allow for um, the city manager to just say, reschedule the meeting, and the person would get notice as they normally would without going through publication or notifying the neighbors as they do at the new time. Okay. Any questions on that, Mary? So thank you for that, Tom. Um, I do have a question um, with respect to item number six on the um, amendment that you yep. sent out, where it says that the city manager may waive, alter, reschedule, any time requirement, deadline, procedure, schedule, hearing, et cetera. And um, tonight, for this particular ordinance, we are um, waiving a public hearing. We're, we're doing certain things. So. Um, is that covered un under a different? So there's no requirement that you actually have a public hearing before for an emergency or okay. at all. Uh, so th that's a rule that you can waive. Uh, this would this would have more to do with say um, the, the, it comes back to the the landmarks board uh, that has to be reviewed within mm -hmm. 60 days. That was mm -hmm. originally on the the agenda tonight. This will allow the city manager to <coughs> to extend those deadlines. So um, the question I asked would be more more pertain more to council rules rather yes. than okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Aaron, I have a question. Aaron, do you want to make a motion? Sure. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, move that we introduce pass on emergency and order published by title, title only in ordinance 8391 uh, as amended with the amendments on the dais, allowing for remote participation at city council and board and commission meetings, allowing for limited public attendance at meetings, provided that there is alternative means of participation and setting forth Bam. related details. Is Second. now joining. In relation thereto. Second. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? I believe this is roll call. Great. We start with Council Member Yates. Aye. Young. Yes. Brockett. Aye. Joseph. Aye. Yes. Nagel. Aye. Swetlick. Yes. Wallach. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Great. Um, so with that, um, we want to bring in our council colleagues who are on the phone. Lynette, can you recall the roll with um, all nine council members? Um, council Member Friend. Here. Counts, uh, Mayor Weaver. Yes. Thank you. The rest of us are still here. Okay. Uh, the next item is um, a, I'd like to get a motion to amend the agenda um, that's on your dais. Um, item 4A is um, a discussion really about whether we should have a um, discussion uh, tonight on approving board and commission appointments. Um, CAC, uh, f uh, because there were, there were some different views expressed by council members, CAC felt that this is something that should be brought to the uh, entire council. Uh, I'd like to move that up to right now rather than waiting to the end of the meeting to have that discussion because I think uh, we may be able to decide pretty quickly on the process question because Debbie's here for one reason and one reason only to run us through boards and commission appointments if we were going to do that. So I'd like to let Debbie go if we're not going to do that tonight. Um, do I have a motion to amend the agenda to move item 4A up to um, right after the, to right now? So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Uh, uh, Sam and Rachel? I am. Yep. Okay, so let's do that now. Um, so I just teed it up. Uh, there's been some discussion about whether we were scheduled to do board and commission appointments tonight. Tom, do you want to um, briefly mention the um, the legal issue? Yeah, you cannot do this legally. So there's, there's absolutely no way you can do this legally. So you, you're going to have to violate the charter in one way or the other, and the question is which way you violate it. So Charter Section 130 provides that you shall um, appoint uh, by March of each year, one member to serve for five years, and that appointment has to happen at a regular meeting of council. You're not going to have a regular meeting of council in March, assuming you'll cancel the meeting for tomorrow. Uh, this is a special meeting. Uh, if you don't do it tonight, then it won't be done in March, because you're not going. I don't know that you're going to have another meeting in March, and you can't just appoint somebody for say, so it's re renew the terms for say a month, and then appoint new people because it says for five years. So the choice that you have is which way. There's minimal risk in um, this violation of the charter. Uh, the risk I see is where you have a board that has quasi-judicial authority, BLA, 
planning landmarks who makes a decision someone could challenge on due process grounds that the person was not was not appropriately appointed according to the charter a person making that decision I think that would be a stretch and I think because of the the, the situation that we're in now uh, that's a, a lawsuit that we would be able to defend easily so I, I, it's it's really up to you from a policy perspective which way you want to do this uh, there isn't a legal way to compel you one way or the other Aaron so Tom if um, CAC at next Monday called uh, a meeting for uh, two weeks from tomorrow uh, that would be in March would that count as a regular meeting I don't w believe so no because the regular meetings are the first and third Tuesdays of the month it has to be charter. those two days those, th those are the okay. those are the regular meetings of the council but if we did that you might be able to make an argument that we're a little closer to compliance because it would still be in March I, I think any argument is going to be the equal of any other argument okay. if you do it in April if you do it tonight if you do it tomorrow well tomorrow would actually be legal but I, I wouldn't advise that um, you, you, they're all defensible under the Thank circumstances you. other questions for Tom Mary so um, two questions um, one is and you might have covered it and I missed it just um, now one is um, we make the appointments and then we ratify them correct so is there is there can the appointments be made and then ratified in April or do both have to be well you usually do the, the, I mean it's just a vote you, what you do is you, you, you the way you usually do the process is you go through and you select and at the end you just vote approving the slate that it's, it's, it's mm. not really ratification it's just the motion for convenience right but my question goes to my next question which is um, we don't have well we have a hearing at the end of all matters and typically we make the appointments under matters yes. so um, we could make um, the appointments and then withhold the public hearing until later is you could do that the public hearing is a matter of your rules so you could you could also waive the public hearing if you chose thank you mark uh, Tom on a scale of uh, one to ten what's your confidence level in defending this any potential suit it's, it's fairly high Thanks. Um, kind of following on Aaron's point um, we're going to have a discussion, I think, a little bit later this evening, or we can have it now if, if folks would like, about um, whether we want to schedule some other meetings during the month of March. Our next regular scheduled meeting is not until April 7th, which is th more than three weeks from now. There may be reasons for council to get together uh, due to the emergency um, and out of their other pressing matters that we may want to tackle um, between now and April 7th. And so uh, I'll just throw out there that the, the possibility of doing what Aaron suggested, which is to hold a meeting either next week or the week after. It's still in the month of March. It doesn't count from a legal standpoint, it sounds like, but it still does get our boards and commission appointed. So we don't, we're don't we not asking the incumbents to stay on that much longer. I would also observe our boards and commissions, aren't our meetings are suspended at least through the end of the month. So um, I think if, and we don't know if that suspension will continue beyond the end of the month, but if we could have a, a board and commission um, appointment and hearing uh, and ratification uh, maybe in a week or two, uh, that may be a, a solution rather than trying to jam it in tonight because I know we've got a pretty full agenda tonight. How do folks feel about that as an idea? It's a great idea. Okay. Yeah, and I just wanted to comment. Um, I, I would support that idea, and one of the reasons is that one of my concerns about not um, making the appointments tonight um, was that there's a lot of time between, there would be a lot of time between the interviews and the appointments, which would then basically require us to go back and watch videos and do things right. um, all over again. Good point. Um, uh, Sam or, or uh, Rachel, do you want to weigh in on this idea? Yeah, I'd like to weigh in. Um, I think that we should have meetings each of the next three weeks, even if they're teleconference meetings. and. Um, you know, I think that we can work in the board and commission appointments as long as we dealt with all the coronavirus um, mitigation that we need to. I think there will be a lot of that. I think we're going to want to get updates from all the people we're going to hear from tonight. But I also think that we can do our business and, and make our appointments, whether it's next week or two weeks. Um, that would be my thought. Rachel? I'll just say, can you hear me? Yep. Hi. Uh, I think that we should push this discussion to when everybody's at home and get everybody out of where they might be infecting each other and role model great social distancing. So I would, uh, uh, I guess, make a motion to 
uh, amend the uh, the agenda and kick this to whenever we want to kick it to, and we can decide that when we're not all in the same room. Okay, but, but conceptually, you're okay with um, with not doing boards and commissions tonight, and maybe doing it whether it's one week or two weeks or three weeks from now. Um, CAC will be meeting next Monday. We can talk about um, how we hold our meeting and, and when we would hold it. But you're okay with the concept? I'm okay with the concept, and just think again, we should really limit this tonight to COVID-19 and, and get get out of that room. Okay, sounds like we have consensus. Okay, everyone's nodding. Great. Um, do we uh, need to do anything else procedurally? We don't need a motion or anything like that, right? We're just major, major scheduling change. You, you can move to agenda, to amend the agenda, but. Oh, oh I, I, we, 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 okay, we, we already, we just did it. Yeah, yeah okay. So okay, I think we're good then. Um, so let's move on to the next item on the agenda, which was originally labeled 2B, which is the COVID-19 briefing. We have um, at least three briefings, um, uh, one from, um, Jeff Zayak with Boulder County Public Health. Jeff has a hard stop at 5.30, so let's get Jeff on first. And then we have uh, Dr. Vissers from Boulder Community Health on the line. And then um, Sam has some stuff to report uh, based on his interactions with uh, CU. So let's start with Jeff. Jane, is there any further introduction of Jeff? Uh, no, there's not. Hey, Jeff. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Jeff Sayak with Boulder County Public Health. I'm the executive director. I appreciate the invite to council and for me to give the opportunity to give an update. I am actually okay. I've got somebody covering my other meeting for the for the first part of it, so I can answer questions because I know this is a big topic. And we're in obviously uh, pretty incredible times at this point. So I've been in public health for going on 31 years now, and we've never been in a scenario like this where we've had such widespread impacts and such uh, big challenges to the decisions that we have to make in order to control this disease. So, um, and I, I know everybody is very aware of that. So what I, my plan is, is to do is to make sure that you are aware of some of the big things that we are working on and what to expect, especially over the coming weeks. Um, and then to be able to answer any other questions associated with that. If there's anything you ask me that I can't get uh, or I don't have the information on tonight, I'll commit to making sure that I follow up uh, with the council on that. So let me, let me start just with the situation that we have right now. Uh, so in Boulder County, we have seven positive or presumptive positive cases. Uh, and what you're going to hear in a minute is that really is not going to matter much for us. It doesn't really matter much for us now, and it's not going to moving forward because the best um, modeling that we've looked at and the best predictions that we have are that if you have a case, you can multiply that case by 50 times, and that's probably the number of cases that you actually have positive in your community. Uh, and that's because the testing, uh, not, not just in Colorado, but the testing in our entire nation is really not adequate in order for us to really be able to pick up all the disease that's spreading in our communities. And we know that. Uh, the governors talked about that several times. We've, we've asked for better testing support multiple times through multiple folks. Uh, and, and again, the governor is very aware of this. So the, the approach that we're taking in public health is that we've got virus in the community um, and that we ought to be doing exactly what you're all doing. Uh, I, I applaud Jane um, for the actions that she's taken uh, to really help start the social distancing and the mitigation uh, strategies because those are going to make the biggest difference right now. Uh, the governor tonight or this afternoon, I believe, is announcing some of the orders that he's putting in place that we have been working with the state on um, that will go out on a statewide basis. We will adopt that state order um, here in Boulder County, and the state order includes, I can uh, just tell you what is included in that, if you give me a second. So the order will include all events for 50 people or more uh, will, will be prohibited. Uh, all restaurants, with the exception of takeout, drive through or delivery, um, will need to close. All bars will need to close. All gyms will need to close. All casinos will need to close, and all theaters will need to close. And um, I, again, I believe that has been uh, released from the governor's office at this point. And the the recognition, again, of the impacts associated with what I just said, I know you all are aware of this. 
uh, this disease, uh, as I'll tell you in a minute um, about what, it, what we might see in the next weeks, it's really important that we do those kind of actions now because, again, we know that we're going to see an increased spread. With every one of those decisions, it has significant impacts in our communities. Um, and it's extremely sad that we're at this point, that we know um, we're going to have to do this because it's the best way to control the disease. Uh, it's going to have impacts on our folks in our communities who don't have access to services. It's going to have impacts on our businesses who don't have the ability to pay their employees. Um, and we know that these impacts are significant, and we don't take any of these decisions anywhere in the state lightly. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty pretty difficult time right now, and it's really a no-win situation. But the information yeah. that we're seeing and the reason that we feel this is so important, and I'm sorry, if you want, if you want to ask a question, you can stop me. Um, Keep going, Joe. You no, know, this is Sam. I, I was just going to confirm that I listened to the governor's speech, and he did everything that you just said about 15 minutes ago. So. Okay, great. Um, the, 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 what we're seeing that's happening right now in Eagle County and the State Health Department and some folks um, from the Colorado School of Public Health who are done doing some of the projections for us are, are seeing a really significant increase in spread in the disease. So as an example, um, there's much more community-wide spread now in, in Eagle County and in Picking County. It's, it's uh, impacting their health care facilities. We expect that fully to come to us. Uh, by, we're expecting by the end of the week that we're going to start to see that kind of increase here in our own communities. So again, we are we are really approaching this less from we have to validate testing and then try to control the spread, and more from we just need to take a prevention focus now and really start messaging about social distancing, um, making sure that people are following uh, these orders. Uh, we do have, which has been great, we have an administrators group that includes all of our towns, uh, uh, all of our municipalities, our university, both of our school districts, um, our fire and police chiefs, and we're meeting uh, on a weekly basis to share the work that we're doing together. So as an example, um, with this order that goes in place, if towns or municipalities choose to want to do something additional to that, the nice thing about having the administrators group together is we can learn, talk, and share with each other about what we're thinking, and then we can make sure we know what each other is doing and support each other in moving those things forward. Um, so I've really appreciated the commitment from the city of Boulder um, and from others to make sure that they're making time uh, to support being at that meeting and thinking through those things together. Um, I know that we're going to, and I, and I know Dr. Visser is, is on the phone, but we know right now that we're already stressing our health care systems. Um, we, like I had said, we have pressed pretty hard on the testing, and I'm not, I'm not, we are not approaching the, the prevention messaging that we're taking forward by waiting on tests because we are not convinced that that is going to improve much, and we just need to treat it as though it is in our community and spreading. Um, and we also don't want to send, um, we don't want people to go into chaos mode when there is, uh, when there's hoarding buying that happens. We all know that when that occurs, then, then some people get a lot and some people get none. Um, and that's, that's not necessary to do. Um, at the same time, uh, we do want to practice social distancing and we want to make sure if we're sick, that we are staying home ourselves. We can, you can always get somebody to, to reach out for you if you're sick to get something. And we want to protect ourselves from others who are sick um, by staying at least six feet away. So I know that's a ton of information. Um, we're working, and, and Mike uh, Chard, who's our Office of Emergency Management Director, could probably talk more about this, but we have our OEM activated. We have, um, we've activated a lot of areas of supports, and we're looking at how can we do the best to provide supports to people in our community who are going to be most impacted by this. So I'll stop there because that's a lot of information. Great. Let's um, maybe as a courtesy let um, Sam and Rachel go first if they've got questions for Jeff, and then we'll bring it back into the room. Sam, do you have any questions for Jeff? I do not have questions. I appreciate the update, and you know, I was on the call earlier, um, so I, you know, I feel like 
our um, community hospital is doing a great job at like being ahead of this and I appreciate all that you're doing. It sounds like from our briefing earlier this afternoon that, that you have capacity right now and that you don't feel like you're gonna be overwhelmed at the moment unless something changed. Is that right? And is that question to Dr. Vissers? Uh, to either one of you, um, you know, do you feel like you have at the moment, <clears throat> given the rate of disease spread that you've seen so far, do you feel like the uh, Boulder community has capacity to handle what we're going to see? Dr. Visters, do you want to answer that from your perspective? Um, yeah, and I can certainly go into more detail. I think the short answer is right now we can, but it all depends. I think it depends on, on where this peaks and what the numbers are and how many really sick people we have all at once, um, which goes back to Jeff's point that anything we can do right now very aggressively to uh, mitigate the spread and, and even just flatten the curve, and I'm sure you've all seen the, the, the diagrams and the explanations, Anything we can do to flatten that curve, even if it doesn't reduce the overall cases but spreads the case uh, burden over weeks to months, um, we're much better prepared. But um, I, can, I can speak to that in a minute. And, and great, Dr. Vissers, I have one more question. <clears throat> um, you had spoken about how you, earlier this afternoon, how you might um, divide and conquer um, people who are COVID positive and who are COVID negative. Um, do you want to tell us a bit more about that? Um, yeah, Sam, did you want me to uh, uh, kind of just give a, uh, an overview of what we discussed earlier? Or, uh, um, would that be helpful if, if you guys are, are, are finished with Jeff? or? Well, let me, let me see, this is Bob. I think let, it would, Bob, what do you think? Yeah, well, I was, um, let's see if we have some more questions for Jeff first, since there's a little time sensitivity there, and then we can ask Dr. Vissers to do his presentation, is, if that's okay with you, Sam. Sure. Um, sure. Bob, I had just, yeah, Rachel. I had just um, one process question. Jeff, you mentioned um, that the county would adopt whatever the government does. Does the city of Boulder actually need to adopt anything in light of the governor's? statements or um, does that sort of cover us for things like restaurant closures? So the only, you don't need to adopt anything. Our, our authority covers both municipal as well as unincorporated. And it would only, the city would only need to adopt something if you wanted to go more stringent than what the state public okay. health order says. Great. Thank you. Um, Mark has a question for Jeff. Um, I, I hope it's for Jeff. Um, let me know if I'm in the wrong place. Um, what do the models show um, about the efficacy of the, um, uh, the actions taken by Governor Polis today? Um, do you have a sense of what the impact of those could be or would be? Yeah, I can't quantitatively tell you what that would be, but what we know and the reason why uh, the governor has been encouraged to act is, be is exactly because of what Dr. Visser said. We know from, uh, from modeling from, uh, I'm sorry, Washington and Oregon, as well as from the Centers for Disease Control, that the earlier on the front end of this that we can put in those, those strategies that mitigate the spread of this disease, the, the, the less that curve shoots up really fast in terms of number of positive cases. So ideally, uh, we would be as far on the front of this as possible, and, it's a, and as you all know, it's a really difficult decision to figure out when the best time is because you're going to have impacts on your community and on the economy and on people. Um, so, so we want to make sure that we're implementing those now, that we're, um, the sooner that we implement them, the likelihood is the least long, longer period of time that you're going to have to have that in place. So as an example, uh, I, I think the orders that I've been seeing have been carrying between four and eight weeks, and uh, each of those orders would be evaluated by those public health directors in uh, accordance with the state to make sure that we've actually knocked down the spread of the disease and that we don't have widespread disease happening before we open things back up. Other questions for Jeff? Jeff, if, if you have a few more minutes to stick around on the call um, after Dr. Vissers makes his presentation, we may have some follow-up questions if you can give us a few more minutes. 
I'm actually happy to stay on the call till the end uh, because I've got somebody who's in that meeting for me, so I'm okay. Great. Dr. Vissers, um, do you want to identify yourself and, and let us know um, how things are looking from the hospital's perspective? Sure. Uh, this is Rob Vissers. I'm the CEO and President of Boulder Community Health. I'm also um, an emergency physician for 25 plus years. Um, and had some experience, I guess, in maybe not exactly like this, but similar situations. So uh, to Sam's question, um, currently we are ready and we are able to care for uh, patients infected with COVID. Although uh, the scale of this is potentially unprecedented, the disease is not unique. Uh, it's a, a, a severe respiratory illness caused by an infectious disease that we care for uh, even now. Uh, and it's no different than taking care of a very sick patient with influenza or pneumonia, um, respiratory disease, and potentially sepsis. So we have the, you know, right now we have the, uh, certainly we have the expertise, and we have the capability and the competency um, to care for these patients, um, uh, and even the, the very sickest ones. Our challenge will be um, the capacity. And, and if, if we are overwhelmed in capacity, we won't be alone. Uh, so it goes to my other point is that although we're ready and prepared and can care for these patients, it really comes down to how much we're able to mitigate the spread and the peak of this um, and how quickly it accelerates in our community. Uh, and what will overwhelm us is when we no longer have enough um, specific resources, intensivists, uh, nurses that can provide uh, ICU care, ventilators um, um, to the patients that are, are very sick. And uh, we can do the care, but the mitigation, um, the response to that, um, the flattening of the curve, 100% of that lies in the actions uh, of the community and the decisions that you make tonight um, and going forward. And, and the sooner um, we can uh, act, um, then we know that uh, the flatter that curve will be and the more that we can spread this out and the more that we are in, in a position to take care of these patients. Um, let me just go specifically to some of the things that, that we're doing. Um, first of all, uh, while the scale of this is, is uh, somewhat unprecedented, or at least the potential, um, we have uh, been through this a number of times, whether it was the preparation that went to Ebola, which didn't manifest, severe uh, flu season, SARS, et cetera. Um, we do uh, have some experience, at least in the preparation side. Um, we're not doing this alone. Uh, we're in daily communication with the Colorado Hospital Association, the governor's office, uh, local public health, Jeff and his team. Uh, as well as um, constant communication with other health systems, making sure that we're sharing information, best practice, and resources. We've established a command center um, where we're monitoring the, the constant changes uh, to facilitate communication and to preserve the uh, resources, including personnel and protective equipment. We've canceled or delayed um, non-essential services, surgeries, and visits. We've expanded telehealth uh, and nurse triage. Um, and currently we are not experiencing any provider shortages. Anything quite the reverse because we are um, shutting down some services and when there's an opportunity for someone to stay home or to do their work remotely, we're, we're facilitating that. We um, are freeing up capacity to uh, cohort the COVID, uh, to, um, um, to your question earlier, Sam, um, we are this week we will be um, creating units where we will cohort uh, both the COVID positive, of which we do not have any in the hospital right now, or the COVID rule out. So people that we suspect may have it, but we're waiting for a test result. Um, and this will help preserve uh, a, a best practice, uh, equipment, um, and hopefully protect others uh, in the hospital. Um, we also are um, already have plans in place to expand our intensive care um, capacity. Um, and we continue to protect our workforce. And so one of the things that we're doing is significantly limiting um, visitors to our hospital and our campus. Uh, we, although there are um, significant uh, limitations in testing that, that are still ongoing in the state, 
We do continue to test at all of our urgent care um, uh, facilities or locations. Um, and we do have enough testing to ensure ongoing um, tests of uh, inpatients, um, making clinical decisions, and making sure that uh, our workforce is free of the disease. Um, I guess the uh, last few things is um, we have a, um, we continuously update our website and uh, we have links obviously to public health and others. Um, but that website is updated every day uh, with um, advice and best practices. Um, and I'll just close with um, uh, that our ability to deal with this is, is comes down to how well we do in preventing the spread and flattening the curve when it comes to the spread of the disease. Great. Thanks, Dr. Vissers. Um, Sam, do you have any questions for either Dr. Vissers or, or follow-up questions for Jeff? I, I think my only question, and I think I have an idea of the answers, <clears throat> is could you, Dr. Bitzers, please tell us what we can do best um, as individuals to uh, prevent the spread of the disease, like hand washing, separation, and so on? If you could just give us a two minute like tutorial, that'd be awesome. Well, I think the, uh, you know, you've been inundated with good advice, uh, hand washing. Uh, social distancing, uh, but I think we're at a stage now where um, we really need to be um, um, isolating and keeping in groups far less than 50, uh, probably five or 10. Uh, and in any unnecessary um, travel or exposure to others um, should be stopped. Um, and and I would follow uh, at a minimum the advice that's put out by um, uh, Boulder County Public Health and, and Jeff's team. Um, I would do whatever you can to reinforce uh, what the governor has just put out. Um, I think being aggressive and proactive um, is only going to help. And at the, in the end, it will probably reduce the overall um, social and economic impact. Uh, you know, obviously, if we can reduce the number of cases, flatten that curve, and get out of this quicker, um, the impact is less. But uh, so. Um, um, you know, but I, I would just follow those, those guidelines that are absolutely apparent. The other thing is, if you have uh, symptoms, um, stay home. Uh, and 95% of the patients that we're testing are negative for COVID. Uh, this is flu season. Uh, it, there's a lot of um, allergies and stuff around. But if you're concerned at all, but you're, it, it feels like a cold to you, just stay home. Seeking testing isn't going to change the care that we have, whether it's positive or negative. You should be home anyways. Uh, we don't have a lot of available testing, um, so I think uh, practicing self-isolation um, and being thoughtful about uh, that is, is probably uh, very important as well. Great. Thank you. Bob. Rachel, do you have questions for uh, either Dr. Vissers or Jeff? Yeah. Thank you so much um, for all that information. It's very helpful. I had a couple follow-ups. Um, number one, you mentioned you've got a great website. Uh, in case some people are, are watching this but aren't checking websites, can you confirm what that website is? BCH.org. BCH.org. And, and uh, Jeff, Jeff, can you give us your website for Boulder County um, Public Health? I'll, uh, I'll look that up right now. I'm sorry, I should know that right off the top of my head, and I'll tell you in a second. Okay, go ahead, Richard. But we, have a, we do have a, a direct link to uh, Jeff's website on, on ours as well. Okay. So There you go. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I had a couple more. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so you mentioned, you know, people shouldn't come in if they have symptoms, um, should stay home and um, isolate. Uh, we've had a lot of questions about um, maybe when, and I think I'm getting extra because I've got a, a family member who's, who people call who works in the emergency room, but when should you go to the hospital? Like, can you give people advice for when, when is it sort of go time to worry and come in? So I think going to the hospital or specifically going to the emergency department should be the last resort. That's where you're very sick. And we're using the, the emergency department to triage patients who we think may or may not need to be admitted. And obviously, we need to continue to care for the, you know, all the things that we've been doing last month, the month before, and all last year, that doesn't go away. People are still having heart attacks and car accidents and, and heart failure, et cetera. So we need to retain that capacity. Um, the best advice is, and I should have said this, is to call your provider. If you call your provider, we've set up a, a nurse triage line 
that will help triage you in terms of the care. Should you just stay home? Should you go to one of our urgent cares for testing? Should you go to our drive-through testing uh, that we've set up? Um, or should you go to the emergency? And so I would call your provider, and if they can't provide the answer, um, you will be um, channeled to a triage uh, nurse who will be able to triage you based on um, your, your risk and your symptomatology. Thank you, awesome. Um, and then uh, one more kind of multi-part question. We've gotten um, a lot of emails with people asking like, what is our plan for overflow if the hospital does fill up and do we have enough ventilators locally? So I don't know if that's something you can speak to, but that might be helpful information for the public. Uh, the answer is yes, we have a plan, um, and it, it, it includes more than just um, ICU care. Um, so we have an opportunity to expand um, other non-critical care um, inpatient. Um, we also have some space at the newly built uh, Della Cava Pavilion um, that we can utilize. And finally, um, we also have plans for um, triaging and care in um, a space away from the hospital. So for example, uh, the, the lower floor of uh, our uh, parking garage or uh, setting up tents, which I've done in the past in, in other um, similar um, episodes like this. Or, um, so, so we do have plans in place. Uh, when it comes to the ventilators, I think the answer is it depends how how um, how many people get sick at once. Um, and uh, right now we're doing everything we can to um, Preserve. So, for example, uh, if we think that a particular surgical case can be delayed, um, and that case is something that might potentially lead to ventilator support, uh, then we'll defer that. Um, we also are considering, um, we have, uh, because we're deferring a lot of surgery, we now have skilled anesthesiologists and their ventilator machines um, that we can utilize. Um, so, uh, we do have plans in place, and our hope is that. Uh, by flattening the curve, by mitigating the disease, that we can manage these patients and give them the care they, uh, that we know we can provide. Awesome, thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, Mary. Thank you, doctor. Um, I have a couple of questions, and one of them has to do with who you will care for. Um, are there any restrictions on um, whether or not people have health insurance? <clears throat> whether or not people are documented. And um, so I guess those, that's uh, one question with multi multiple parts. Well, that's, a, that's an easy question. We're just, we, we're gonna do what we've always done. Um, uh, last year we provided $60 million in uncompensated care. Uh, and it was regardless of uh, your ability to pay, your insurance status, or um, whether you were documented or not. Um, and uh, so we, we obviously, in a, in a crisis like this, would continue, um, well, uh, you know, our, our mission. Thank you. Um, and my other question is, um, do you have any of this information available in languages other than English? understand. But could you repeat that, sorry? Do you have any information available other in languages other than English? Um, we do on the uh, on the inpatient side, um, but that's a great point. I don't know that our, our constant website updates uh, have been. In fact, I'm, I'm sure they haven't, and so um, that's something that we can get on soon. I appreciate that that uh, that input. We do have Spanish translators and medical providers uh, Spanish-speaking uh, on the campus, but as far as uh, community-facing, um, I think we can beat that up. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron. Thanks, Dr. Vissers, for all that information as well as Jeff. I, by the way, I was uh, just on the BCH website, and there is a Google Translate function built into the website, but that's not quite the same as actual translation, right? So, um, I do have a question for Jeff. Um, so, Jeff, it sounds like you were part of the discussions, your department were part of the discussions with Governor Polis about uh, the steps that he's just announced. I wonder if you have any recommendations for us here in the city of Boulder. Do you feel like there were any things that weren't just announced that our particular city might benefit from over and above um, those actions? Well, I think one of the things that, that others have done that we've seen across the nation is they've looked at 
should they be moving to other non-essential business functions as an example? Um, and I think that, that that was a step that was a little too far to go um, because of potential impacts in our community. And I know that there's a potential group that's going to be thinking about that, but at this point, I think the recommendations that are put forth are the place to start and that we should make sure that we are messaging and that people are following that and that we're supporting them and we're using the prevention message, and it's going to move us a long way if we can do that. Thanks so much. Other question, uh, Mark. A couple of questions. Uh, exactly how many ventilators do we have? Uh, was, that, was that directed to me? It's directed to either one of you. Um, I, I, would, I would go to Dr. Vissers for that, for BCH. I could answer that if I had access to all of the hospital websites, but I don't have that information with me. Okay. Um, and I guess this question um, go ahead. I'm not sure I can give you the exact number, but I'm not sure that that matters. Uh, um, I think um, we are um, working with all the hospitals where we are reporting all of our um, total equipment, uh, ventilators, masks, protective gear, et cetera, to make sure that they are um, adequately distributed or uh, allocated um, where appropriate. Um, and uh, right now I haven't seen what that statewide number is. Um, uh, but uh, certainly right now we, we have uh, capability both in personnel and ventilators. And it doesn't just come down to the ventilators. You need uh, physicians that can manage it. Uh, you need um, ICU nurses that can care for it. You need respiratory therapists. Um, and you need um, uh, the care environment and in some case negative pressure rooms. And so um, although we, we like to get it down to a single item, um, it's the entire team and, and their competency that, that's uh, required beyond just the machine itself. My, my second question is you've emphasized the need to get out in front of this. And I, I certainly share that concern. Um, does that argue for something as dramatic as what San Francisco did with a shelter in place order? I mean, it would be disastrous economically, but would it be efficacious in terms of, you know, blunting the curve? I can I can take a shot at that. Um, so, if you if you listen to Dr. Fauci as an example, um, who's a national public health expert in this area, uh, Dr. Fauci would would lean forward and encourage that you do those kinds of measures very early on before you have almost any cases in your community, and that that is the best approach to stopping the complete spread of the disease. Um, so that, that is one perspective uh, from a public health expert that's been out there for a while. And I think we have to see what's going to happen in Colorado with the approaches that we're taking here. And, and hopefully it will reduce the curve. I do believe it will reduce the curve if we reduce the social distancing and we, we implement these strategies and we do it in a comprehensive way where people really follow it. I do believe because there's so much focus that's put on this right now and you can see this both nationally as well as Colorado as well as locally, that people are jumping ahead and they're taking um, actions themselves to, to, go, to step ahead of even what's out there right now. I guess my concern is, is should we be jumping to the end of the movie and, and looking at something like a shelter in place uh, uh, action, uh, would that do more for us than uh, chasing the curve um, uh, with a series of uh, lesser actions that we may have to amend later? Uh, and you know, could we get better effect from doing that for two weeks than doing a series of things that, that we may have to keep amending and revising as we're, as we're chasing the virus? I don't know the answer. I'm, I'm simply asking. Yeah, I would. Sorry, let me take you off the speaker. Um, I would, I would not recommend that we do that at this point. We will, like I had, I think I had said earlier, we would support people who want to step ahead on that. But we, the data that we're looking at as well, we know that there's impacts 
to, to residents when we do things like that. And we've heard this loud and clear from our uh, municipalities that doing those kind of measures will have significant impacts on our children. They'll have significant impacts on families that can't get the services that they need. And it's a really difficult balance. Uh, it's a really difficult balance when we start talking about those things. And, um, and it's been a really difficult decision-making process. I understand. Thank you. Other questions? Mary. So I have kind of a follow-up question to um, Mark's ventilator question, which is um, you were talking earlier about how you're preparing and you're um, making room for being able to handle more patients. And I was wondering if you could give us an approximation of what that um, extra room, including what you have now or on a regular basis, what that number might be? Um, I'm not sure I can do that. I, I can tell you that, uh, um, yeah, it, 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 it really depends on, on how well we're able to manage the current um, load of patients that we have that aren't related to COVID. Uh, we um, we expect that we, by Wednesday, are going to be able to free up a 23-bed unit um, and have that available. Um, un unfortunately, uh, uh, historically, at least this year for our medical surgical beds, we've been running at about 90% occupancy. Um, and um, but a, a significant number of those are uh, elective surgical cases. So, uh, but we will be freeing up a 23-bed unit um, by midweek. Um, and uh, hopefully we can um, increase that uh, as, as time moves on. That's just within the hospital itself. Um, we are looking at um, uh, other, other areas that we could uh, care for and manage patients, um, including the uh, operating room or a recovery area or um, uh, some unbuilt out space. So something above 23? Is that what I'm hearing? So I, I think you're looking for a specific number to uh, or just a question. you know is um, because uh, even just within our hospital we don't just have uh, beds we have uh, critical care beds we have step down beds we have um, post acute care and uh, post op recovery beds um, maternity beds um, emergency et cetera and and so. They are all designed to manage the gamut of severity and acuity, which we expect that that will increase, and it will increase across that acuity as well. So, um, um, so I would say yes, that at a minimum, uh, and we expect to be able to expand that. But it depends on the type of beds as well, um, and we do think that we would be able to significantly increase our ICU bed capacity as well. Thank you. Other questions for our experts? Jane, do you have anything that you'd like to ask? No, I don't. Thanks. Great. Um, so, um, Dr. Vissers and Jeff, thanks so much for participating. You're welcome to stay on if you'd like to listen in as we as we move in a few minutes to policy questions. Um, your um, assessments and your recommendations were certainly sobering, and I think they provide us with some good guidance about what we do from a policy perspective, and we really appreciate your expert opinions and advice and your connections with um, healthcare providers around the state and across the country. Um, we may be having some more meetings here over the next couple of weeks on this topic, and, and we would always welcome your participation. Um, and uh, we may very well invite you to come back again and, and give us some further, um, further briefing. But thank you so much for being available tonight on short notice. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. And we're, uh, yeah, my pleasure. And, and certainly, if, if not myself, someone from our, our team will make themselves available. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, we have one more item on the briefing. Um, we Again, this was all put together on very short notice, so this is not a criticism, but we, we had hoped to um, invite or to get somebody from CU to um, to be able to come tonight, but they're dealing with some other issues as well. But, but Sam Weaver um, has been able to communicate with CU and, and can pass along some of the things that they're doing. Dr. Robert Vissers. Is now exiting. Sam can can brief us on um, some of the discussions he's had or information he's gotten from CU and, and maybe at one of our next meetings we can get somebody from CU to attend. But Sam, do you want to brief us a little bit about what CU is doing? 
Sure. You know, um, what CU is doing right now is shutting down the campus, more or less. Um, so not only are, are they sending folks home from the undergraduate program, yeah, but they, they are also is now exiting. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so, so I think that CU is doing a very um, responsible, measured uh, response to what's going on. Um, you know, one of the things that we've heard about is uh, parties on the Hill. And, you know, we, we have a response from the Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs, Akira Bradley, who is encouraging uh, the students who are still around to be responsible, be mindful of their actions, uh, look out for themselves and each other. Um, so that's one big thing. And I think the other main thing is that um, CU is slowly shutting down. And so as well as asking uh, the students who are still around to be responsible, um, I think that even the grad students and the research labs are being asked to shut down. So that's what I know. I need to go on at great length. Um, hopefully we'll hear from you uh, representatives in the next week or two. And Jane can speak a little bit about the order that um, she um, signed this morning relating to um, gatherings. But any questions for Sam about CU? We'll hope to get CU representatives to uh, an upcoming meeting. Okay, great. So th that's the end of the, this briefing. Again, we'll probably have um, additional briefings in the future. Um, we've got, I just want to point out, we've got really great resources um, at uh, the city's webpage. Uh, if you can simply Google um, uh, Boulder and coronavirus. And Patrick uh, von Kaiserling and his team have maintained lots and lots of information and links there um, to Boulder uh, uh, County Public Health to uh, state and, and uh, national resources. Um, that is also in Spanish, um, and that continues to be updated uh, daily, uh, sometimes hourly, with new information, new resources, new FAQs. So I would encourage folks to, to go to the city's webpage on the coronavirus and, and learn more information. And I think with that, we're going to turn it over to um, to Jane and her team to talk a little bit about some of the steps they've taken, and then um, uh, uh, some steps that we might take. I think Jane's going to be looking for some direction from us on a few things. Uh, and um, we can certainly provide direction whether it's sought or not. And then um, we do need to do a matter of, of business at the end of that discussion, which is to um, affirm and extend uh, the uh, emergency, emergency powers um, that were put in place a few days ago. So Jane, it's yours. Thank you. And before we jump into the city update, um, I did hear from Francis Draper, just a clarification, that the dorms are actually open because there are students that really cannot easily go home. Um, so they're open, but what we're doing is that we are encouraging them to go home if they can, but allowing them to stay if they cannot. Um, so that is just a clarification from CU. But anyway, on to the city response. So we have a number of people that are gonna be talking about it. Uh, and I'm gonna start off with Tanya Angie, who is our deputy city manager, and she'll be talking about the teams that we've established and what we're doing there. Tanya? Thank you, Jane. Uh, Tanya Angie, deputy city manager. Um, Chris, can you forward? Um, so the city staff have come together um, and created guiding principles and response team objectives that we've used in our decision-making process. And I, I just want to step through those um, with you and also for the benefit of the community. Um, so number one is preserve the health care system. We've already talked to, tonight about flattening the curve. In addition, ensure continuity of government, deliver essential services, and in a bit, Chris will talk about what are our essential services. Focus on equity. All community members are included, um, meaning that we are looking at the impacts of, of all in the decisions. Response team objectives include effective communication, that is within the organization, with council, with the community. Ensure continuity of operations. That goes back to the delivering the essential services. Meet emergency needs in coordination with partners. You'll hear more about that tonight, um, and I think 
the conversation so far illuminates we cannot respond to this alone or in a vacuum. We need to be doing that together with others. Equitably, equitably care for employees and the community and identify and address ways this pandemic may exasperate existing inequities. And I do wanna highlight, um, thank you to Council Member Young um, for forwarding the real, REALS principles because we actually went back and made some amendments to our um, guiding principles and team objectives to reflect that. Chris, can you forward please? So high level um, actions that we've taken to date have been launched our internal city response team. And we've broken that response team into three different areas. areas. So one focused on internal operations, so finance, HR, communications, um, external operations. So that's really focusing on our direct essential service delivery um, operations and then community services, so community partnerships, et cetera. We declared an emergency on Saturday, March 14th. The Emergency Operations Center was activated, which is commonly also known um, through the acronym EOC, and we are moving to a regional coordination um, response. I do want to indicate um, that Mike Chard is also on the call, so if council members do have questions specifically around the EOC actions, he's on the call to be able to answer those. You might mention who Mike Chard is. Oh. Thank you. Um, Mike Chard is the Director of Emergency Management for Boulder County and the City of Boulder. We closed all city facilities to public employees on Sunday, March um, 15th. Employees had until 5 p.m. today to actually um, take any needs um, that they have out of their offices. Um, so that they can work remotely. This is incredibly important because we are going to be focusing cleaning um, of facilities for essential employees, but we also do need to go through and clean um, other facilities as well. Um, I do wanna indicate, cause this question has came up, is our uh, passive open spaces open still with this closure? And yes, they are. Um, issued three emergency orders, which included the closure of city buildings, clo uh, closing of tonight's council meeting and prohibiting public gatherings in public spaces. Um, tonight, discussed at the end of the staff brie uh, briefing is consideration of additional emergency order or orders. So uh, Mr. Yates had already highlighted communications um, and I do want to commend the communication staff for the work that they've done very quickly um, in this space. Um, so Boulder at bouldercolorado.gov coronavirus is um, the landing page for all coronavirus information. Um, as was previously indicated, this is updated um, throughout the day, including um, on weekends. This information is actually available and translated in both English and Spanish. As of 5 p.m. today, all city press releases and other communications will be in both English and Spanish. Um, coronavirus video news will be starting to be produced on March 13th, which will be a weekly video uh, production. This will also be in English and Spanish, and we will be posting that not only on the city website, but also on social media, as we've seen um, great, um, great utilization of video on social media. Interesting data point is our web traffic on the coronavirus page. Um, and so that data point is seen on your screen. That's a 3,200% above average um, um, stop. So we, f we feel that community as well as employees are finding uh, this page to, to be of value. With that, I will turn it over to Chris who will talk briefly about essential services and protecting our employees. Thanks, Tanya. I'm Chris Meschuk, I'm the other deputy city manager. Um, right now we are in a, an operational state where we're focusing on delivering essential services to our community. And so um, listed on the screen are really, what are our critical essential services? What are the things that really, really have to continue? And that is our law enforcement, so our police department as well as the open space rangers, um, the fire rescue department, um, our water and wastewater services and, wa uh, and delivery and treatment, as well as transportation and access, and then of course our citywide response team. That's the team that are um, our core uh, essential staff that are continuing to work. 
We do have other essential services that are essentially for emergency response or um, in order to kind of keep the rest of the operations running. So our Parks and Recreation Forestry Department is on call in case there are any winter storms, if there's any trees down. In other words, those things to ensure um, continued access throughout the community, um, as well as um, our right-of-way inspectors and our building inspectors are available for emergency on call. Um, as well as then we have some of our internal operations staff from finance, the city attorney's office, human resources, et cetera, that are still working to um, support our essential operations. The rest of our staff um, are um, working remotely from home if possible um, and or may be redeployed uh, in support of one of these essential services. Chris, I think Adam has a question. Yeah, Chris. This isn't our essential service, but uh, have we been in contact with Excel about electricity and anything that they're doing, you know, in terms of mitigating? There are um, other essential services in the community, power, um, trash collection is another big one. Um, and so we do have folks um, both inside the city as well as through the Emergency Operations Center that help interface with some of those critical services. You know, uh, I, Excel put a statement out today. I wonder if we could link that on our website and, and if Western Disposal also has one, maybe we could link that. Yeah, we'll look into it. Great point, Adam. So there was um, some questions that came up around um, what are we doing to take care of our first responders and our essential employees? And so uh, within our um, public safety dispatch, um, we have screening, screening protocols for those incoming calls to 911 um, to help screen for um, potential COVID-19 patients. Um, that helps inform our response personnel to know um, where, you know, what's the condition of the person that they may be going to interact with. Um, both our police and fire department have personal protective equipment that they are carrying with them. Um, we've also increased cleaning of vehicles. There's a very detailed protocol on how to do that, especially for ambulances. Um, we're also encouraging online and phone reporting for folks. Um, of course, practicing social distancing in our buildings as well as social distancing for our first responders in certain cases of where they're um, uh, responding to certain facilities, like long-term care facilities. Um, we've also, of course, increased the cleaning of our essential workspaces here inside the city. Um, and then we've been working in partnership with our medical director um, in both fire and police regarding our return to work and quarantine protocols in the event that there is any exposure or illness for our first responders. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kurt Fernhaber, our Director of Housing and Human Services, to talk through uh, some of the work, detailed work that they've been doing um, with uh, their services. Uh, good evening, Council. Um, Kurt Fernhaber, Director of Housing and Human Services. So um, last week we um, uh, started working on uh, a plan for uh, individuals that are experiencing homelessness in relation to the, uh, the COVID-19. And as you're aware, there's um, challenges that they face that um, the rest of the community has a, an easier time with. And things like social distancing is, is more difficult. Um, and, um, you know, when, when Jeff earlier was talking about, you know, stay at home if you don't feel good, that's that's difficult for our homeless population. Um, their general health is, is not as good. And um, those that are sim uh, have symptoms of COVID-19, we don't you know, currently have um, a plan for where they go or wh where they would be housed. So at the end of the last week, we put a group together with um, uh, uh, members of our team, City of Longmont, um, Boulder County and Public Health, and, um, and members of EOC. And um, we came up with a, a plan um, that was uh, completed on Saturday, um, which, um, which is the slide in front of you, um, called phase one. So phase one was, was uh, implemented uh, this morning. So the, the table there kind of shows you the, the different services that we have um, that are critical to the homeless population, and particularly, you know, where they sleep at night. So you're familiar with um, the 30th Street location, which has three functions. 
navigation, which has 50 beds. Um, we currently have about 20 that are in the navigation program. That's dropped from the average of 38 that we had um, a month or two ago. Um, coordinated entry, which doesn't require beds, and um, severe weather shelter, which is 72 beds. The, uh, the North Boulder shelter, where we have housing and focus shelter, has 160 beds, um, and that bed use um, has, about, has been about 120 um, uh, over the last month. So what we've done is we've moved some of these functions. So you may have remember, remembered from the last time uh, I was in front of council on this particular issue, we were going to move the navigation services to the North Boulder shelter um, in a few months. We've actually moved that function there this morning. So those individuals that were in navigation uh, are now at the North Boulder shelter. We'll, we still have um, about 20 beds of, um, of uh, um, additional capacity. And the services for navigation will also be occurring um, at the North Boulder shelter. So the staff from, from um, uh, Bridge House will be um, providing the services there. Severe weather shelter will stay where it is. However, um, it will take over the entire building instead of half of the building um, as it's previously been set up. So um, what, what, is enabled, what has occurred today is that there's been a thorough cleaning of the 30th Street location, and then the 72 beds have been spread um, throughout the facility um, to increase separation between um, individuals. Um, if I could get you to go on to the next slide, um, phase two. So this is a, um, a plan which is in process right now. And uh, this, this, the, uh, the evolution of this plan also started last week. Um, we've also been working with, with public health um, and the EOC on this plan. Essentially, it's, cr it's creating a third location um, for homeless individuals to go if they're um, um, symptomatic. And so with this, each person would be screened um, every evening at, at entrance to one of the two facilities. If they're symptomatic, they would be taken by transportation um, directly to this third facility um, where there would be 24 hour service and um, um, some medical um, staff to, to oversee their care. Um, at this point, public health has told us that they don't have um, testing, and you sort of heard that earlier. There's not a lot of um, testing available, so it's in question whether those individuals would be tested or not. Um, but they would be put in a facility where they had um, more isolation and support. Um, including medical support. We're, um, I, I just got off of a call at five o'clock with the EOC on this particular plan. Um, some of the challenges that we're having are the availability of PPE or the personal protection equipment. And um, until that can be sourced, um, we wouldn't be able to set this up. We're, look, we're currently looking at two different possible locations one is the fairgrounds in Longmont and the other is the East Boulder Rec Center. Um, if you could move to slide uh, 12. So there's sort of three areas that we've been, um, that we've been focusing on. The first is community services. So the, the city has been uh, carefully tracking the needs of the community members um, really through close coordination with uh, Boulder County and many of our service agencies um, in the community. So we've um, organized a structure to regularly communicate with um, our various nonprofit organizations that are doing this work. Um, also, you will have seen at, uh, at 4.30 this afternoon on this, the city's uh, uh, coronavirus website that's been mentioned earlier, we had um, a document go up there, which is um, frequently asked questions 
which um, guides the community um, to where they should go for particular needs. And um, we've, we've also been able to maintain um, um, support um, with um, food assistance, financial assistance, transportation, um, childcare supports, um, case management for older adults, um, and um, mediation. So the um, the we've also um, organized two group. Well, we haven't organized. The, there's two groups that have been going on for some time, um, but we've brought them back together. One is our funding funders collaborative, um, which has been meeting. Uh, which meets typically um, two or three times a year, but now we're meeting on a regular basis. The Funders Collaborative is made up of City of Boulder, City of Longmont, Boulder County, the community foundations from each of the, the communities um, and other funders like United Way. So the, what, what, what we're doing with the funding uh, collaborative is ensuring that um, we are aligned in um, what we are supporting and making sure that um, the needs of the community are being met with the, um, the various funding streams. Um, um, also, the, um, um, the community foundation has set up an account um, for support that can um, go towards several different organizations. Um, and then at the end, there is a family resource network. That's also um, um, an organizational structure that has been in place. Um, and that's, um, you know, various organizations um, that uh, you know, support the community in various ways. So really uh, bringing them together um, and understanding, understanding what their needs are. Um, and lastly, before I before I close, and then you can um, uh, ask me any questions. Um, so the um, we, we've heard from the community about um, um, concerns with eviction, um, and um, I would um, I would say that eviction is one, or uh, the the inability to pay your rent at the end of the month is one of many. Um, community needs that we're tracking right now, and um, it shouldn't be looked at in isolation. We have several organizations that we fund that give um, rent assistance, and um, so we have structures in place to assist um, families and individuals um, that are struggling with that, as well as other needs. We also have contracts in place um, with um, all of these organizations, and we would be able to, um, um, with our funding collaborative, um, add resources to that as needed um, within the community. So I will stop there if there's questions or if you want to keep going and, and come back for questions. Yeah, well, can we just keep going? Or sure. even, is that all right? Um, I'll have a few questions. Okay. Um, I, so I'll add them first and then Aaron and Mary. So I do want to touch more on this part in particular. I assume now is not the time to do that. Um, well, why don't you go ahead and. Uh, questions. Is it a question or more of a. No, just more of a discussion. Let's, um, let's hold a discussion because I think when we get to the end of the meeting, we talk about future meetings, that would be a good time to talk about th those type of topics. Any Perfect. Questions for Kurt up to this point? Aaron and then Mary. <laughs> Thanks for all that, Kurt. Very helpful. Um, just on the thing you were just talking about, you were saying that additional funding uh, could potentially be deployed for rental support. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, I know we have the um, Keeping Families Housed program that we work with the Emergency Family uh, Assistance Association on. Are there other rental support programs that we currently run or that we might, um, that we might support as well? Yes, so we also support um, rental support for individuals. So we have one, one program set up for families and one for individuals. Okay, where is that individual one run out of? I don't think I'm familiar with that. So currently that actually one, runs to our coordinated entry program. Um, and um, part of that is, is 
um, is to actually prevent um, individuals from becoming unhoused. Great, okay. So earlier this year, we actually, um, I think it was about, well, no, it's actually um, in 2019, about midway through 2019, um, I believe we started that program. Thanks for that. And then going back uh, to issues with folks experiencing homelessness, I, one of the, the things that we've heard about is the need for um, potentially better sanitation facilities for folks who are, who are unhoused. Are we thinking about providing, uh, say, hand washing stations uh, for uh, out in the community at all? Um, I wouldn't be able to answer that. I don't know. Um, I know um, Parks and Rec was was looking at that, but I wouldn't be able to um, um, I wouldn't be able to answer that. Okay, that's uh, fine. I'll bring it up a little later in the meeting. Then thanks for for all that. Right. If I could add though to that, there's there's been um, uh, increased infection control within both 30th Street and um, the North Boulder Shelter. Um, they've uh, at the North Boulder Shelter. They've added additional cleaners. Um, so they're cleaning a couple times per day um, at 30th Street, their bed layout. Um, they've, um, they're masking um, individuals which, who are symptomatic. Um, Clinica is visiting um, twice per week. Um, they're changing some of their food service protocols and staggering meals and showers. Um, and they've also put in place CDC cleaning protocols and signage. That's great to hear. Actually, I'll, I will do one other follow-up. Um, the phase one and phase two of the shifting of services sounds like a really well put together plan uh, to minimize kind of the risk of, of infection and transmission for, for unhoused folks. Uh, that phase two, uh, I hear there's, um, there would be challenges uh, finding a location on that, but do you have a potential time frame for that, hitting that phase two goal? Well, as, this, as of this morning, we thought it was gonna be tomorrow. Um, we have a meeting with the EOC tomorrow where we'll be able to um, probably uh, come closer to answering some of those questions. Um, the challenge I don't think is finding the location. We have two locations that will work. Okay. Um, we have the transportation set up. We have the meals set up. It's really the, uh, the, the clinical support and the, the PPE, which is um, uh, sort of the challenge at this point. Okay, thank you for that. Mary? <clears throat> so on, with respect to um, getting information to both families and individuals who are unhoused, how are they receiving information, just like the basic information about how uh, symptoms and, and, and um, sanitation, things like that? Okay, I, I'm not sure I totally heard your question properly. So, um, um, I don't know. How, how are individuals being communicated necessary information such as what the symptoms are of the illness and um, sure. what preca the, the precautions to prevent the illness? Yes. So, um, for um, 30th Street and, and the shelter, um, their, strap, their staff have gone through training, they have signage up, they're monitoring um, individuals as they come in. They're, so they're doing an educational outreach um, within the facilities. Um, and as far as reaching out to the, to the wider community, um, we're really relying on the existing structures um, and the, 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 um, the organizations that are connected with the community. Thank you. And you mentioned the funding collaborative. I was curious to know what the source of dollars, is it mostly donations or are there other sources as well? Um, it's, some of it is donations. Um, and for the city, you know, we have the, um, the Human Resource Fund, and we also have the, have, have the Health Equity Fund. We do have some resources there. We also have a, a system in place called the Opportunity Fund, 
and that's funding that can come through at any time of the year. So we have a structure in place where we can move quickly if needed. Um, but the, the community foundation will, is, has certainly started a process for trying to raise um, resources to support these um, initiatives. And Kurt, on, you mentioned the um, Health Equity Fund. Is that, that's yes. usually distributed via grant proposals. And is there a way to um, allocate for emergencies such as these? As this? Yes, and that's, yeah, and that can work within the structure of the Opportunity Fund. Thank you. And then um, finally, with respect to the question about evictions, I heard this afternoon yep. that the courts have um, suspended non essential cases through, I believe it was May 31st. Um, Maybe that's not for you, Kurt, but just in general, I heard that, and I just wanted confirmation. And if that does affect um, eviction cases. I'm not aware of that. I don't know if Tom knows, knows more information. Chris, you looks like you have something to say. Just that um, we were on a phone call last night that included the courts, and they were talking about adjusting and changing their operations. I don't have the details on exactly what they've done, but um, we can follow up and find that information. Yeah, out. I heard that. I spoke with Megan Fancel of um, Barha this afternoon, and she's the one that mentioned it. So, good. Thank you. Junie, That's all I have. I think Junie had some questions. How long have we paused? <laughs> right. I'm behind sorry. Us. Can I jump in once more? Um, uh, for, for Mary's question, um, I was also, um, you also would have seen that Barra reached out this afternoon and they're really encouraging their landlords to work with um, their tenants um, as, as necessary to find ways to, um, you know, create flexible payments and that sort of thing for you know, individual needs. Okay, we have uh, Junie and then uh, Rachel and uh, Sam. Hi, Kurt. I just wanted to, this is Junie, by the way. I wanted to just oh, go back and talk a little bit because you mentioned people who are in homeless situation and I wanted to talk more uh, maybe slightly an update if there are still people living in camps, are there any encampments around town? Because I know um, Mary just mentioned, you know, what type of outreach we're doing, and you mentioned park and recs. And I thought people couldn't camp on parkland, so somehow um, in my mind there's some type of a disconnect there because to me it goes back to what brought Aaron just mentioned about sanitation and outreach for people who are living in encampments and in tents around town. If we don't have people living in camps and tents, I suppose that question would be moot, but I just wanted you to give us a little bit of an update or some information around that. Thank you. Sure. So, um, yeah, thanks for allowing me to clarify that. So my understanding from, uh, from Aaron's question was um, um, hand washing and sanitizing um, for people who are to, out in the public, which um, I understood that could, you know, could be anyone that was um, out in the parks during, during the day. Um, I wasn't necessarily reflecting on those that were, that were camping. Um, while there, um, we don't currently have um, um, encampments um, right now, we, there are individuals that do camp within the city. Um, and um, the, um, the, the, the hot team really works with those individuals um, and is aware of um, almost all of them and connects with them on a regular basis to try to assist them in getting into services. Okay, anything else, Jenny? Rachel? Um, thanks, thanks so much, Kurt. This is Rachel. I have uh, two questions. 
Number one, um, I think it's uh, probably a simple one to answer, but um, I think I heard you say that for sheltering people with symptoms, we were maybe looking at the East Boulder Rec Center. And I was kind of just wondering why that particular rec center, I understand that they are all shut down and so nobody should be going, but let's say that somebody does show up and encounters somebody in the parking lot or makes it through the door or whatever. Um, why would we have the rec center that doubles as a senior center be the one that we target for this? Well, we, we have um, communicated well with our seniors um, that both of the senior centers have been shut down. Um, the, the reason the rec center is being looked at, and I would say the rec center is probably a second choice um, at this time. Um, the fairgrounds was put up as the, as the first choice from the, from the perspective of the EOC. Um, the, the East Boulder Rec Center is better structured than the North Boulder Rec Center um, from the number of rooms and size of rooms um, and um, uh, sort of the, the layout of the, of the facility. Um, if this were to be set up, there would be the people that would be coming there as clients would actually be coming um, on a, um, a designated um, bus. Um, and so others wouldn't be coming into the facility unless they came through in that fashion. So it really wouldn't be open to the public. Um, okay. The doors would, would, would likely be locked. Okay, perfect. Um, and then second, and I'm not sure this is a question for you, I don't know at what point to bring it up, but um, part of my background is both working as a guardian ad litem and as a YWCA um, attorney and victim advocate. And so I've got a lot of experience of going into homes with abusive parents and um, battered women. And I understand that a lot of this is gonna be the county's purview, but given that safety is within the city's purview, and we might be locking people down and having people shelter in place with their families, and some of those families are going to be um, abusive families and unsafe homes. I'm just wondering what we might be doing to address that for women and kids who might be you know, instructed to stay in those homes. I don't know that I have the answer to that. Um, that I, we could reach out to Boulder County because the, the social services would fall underneath them. Um, but I can certainly reach out to them tomorrow to get a response to that. Okay, and, and again, like, you know, I know we're not supposed to intermingle sort of with other families, but if we could find a way to make sure that we are um, checking in on families that, that have known risks and also maybe some public education around you know, if you if your kid has a friend who you you know or, or whatever needs sure. to come over, yep. then that's an acceptable exception to this. Okay, thanks. Rachel and yep. Kurt, Rachel and Kurt, this is Tanya. Can I just add additional context to why East Boulder um, Rec Center? So the reason um, for East Boulder is also because there's multiple divided spaces within the facility, so that we can separate. Um, it's the largest space, and it's so it's most easily supported um, by um, EOC. Also, the proximity to the hospital is something that was taken into consideration as well. And then specifically, Rachel, this is Chris. Good Thank you. Um, related to your question about um, also some of the supportive services that go and enter into homes, that's an issue that um, uh, we are aware of and coordinating through the Emergency Operations Center. Um, our um, vulnerable populations section within the EOC um, has that on their radar and is coordinating that with those service providers. Great, thanks. Sam, did you have questions for Kurt? Yeah. Anybody else have questions? Sam, Sam may be speaking and I'm mute or, or maybe doesn't have any questions. It sounds like Tom has something. I just wanted to confirm what we've also heard that the, the uh, district, the district court and the county court are con uh, continuing all non-essential cases until after May 31st. Okay, good, maybe we can get some more information on that in the next meeting. We're supposed to announce something next week. It's not formal, we've heard that informally in a meeting. Great, thanks for that update. Other questions? So Bob, I'm aware that, I'm aware that Sam had a question earlier today about Meals on Wheels. Okay. Um, so Meals on Wheels is um, continuing to function um, out of the, uh, the Age West Center. And although the building is locked up, they're continuing to make meals from there. They are delivering meals 
and they're also looking to increase their capacity for um, to support additional seniors. Um, they are looking for more uh, financial resources from the community to support that work, um, as well as drivers. Okay, so just to repeat that, Meals on Wheels is looking for financial support and some additional volunteers as drivers. That's correct, and you can um, just go to their website. Okay, if, if someone wants to volunteer and make a contribution, go to Meals on Wheels website here in Boulder. Okay, great. Other questions for Kurt? I know we kind of interrupted you there, Kurt. Do you have some more? Uh, I'm done, thank you. Okay. Okay, on well, to financial Just a second, maybe Mirabai has something. I actually had something. Chris, could you also, if it's okay with council, add one more thing to the web page? Um, there's some really good articles out there from the Humane Society and whatnot that, you know, your pets aren't carriers, so don't be dropping your pets off and having them euthanized. Um, it'd just be nice if we could get a good link with, I mean, there's a ton of articles out there about how it's been proven there, you know, there's no proof that they are carriers. Great. Anything else? Okay, Jane. Super. So at CAC, Council asked for um, information about the financial considerations that we might encounter as a result of this situation. So we think that the revenue impacts could be significant, but it's way too early to tell what they are. As you may know, but maybe the community doesn't, when we achieve revenue in March, we don't know that we got it or not until it's received in late April. So we're always lagging by a month to know how our revenues are coming in. So we're gonna process it and report it as quickly as possible. One of the things that could be helping us is that um, while there's definitely going to be a significant impact, there has been a lot of um, people going to grocery stores and general retail stores. And so that activity may well be up for March, which might modify to some extent the, the negative downturn that we think we're going to see. Um, there's likely significant both medium and long-term impact to the economy because we'll have reductions in tourism activity, which brings quite a bit of revenue into the city, as well as store closures with possible job losses of the employees that are working there and less consumer spending as a result of that. So this is all a vicious circle that um, is really gonna be hard to move out of. Um, as of March 10th, the official state economic forecast has not been adjusted. So looking at the next slide, um, some of the things just to keep in mind, this is a little bit of data that you might be interested in. In a normal year, 38% of our total revenues come from sales and use tax. And 48% or 50% of it comes from um, our total revenues when you exclude utilities. So just remember that we do get a lot of income from people paying for their water bill, their sewer bill. If you take those out of there, which are um, enterprise funds that go specifically to operating those facilities, the general fund operates without that money being considered. So 50% of our general fund revenue comes from sales and use taxes. When we take a look back at last year, our total sales and use tax revenue for 2019 was around 142 million. And in March, which is the month that we're in now, a year ago, we got about 8.5% of the total. And when you take a look at where that came from, about 30% of that total comes from eating places and general retail, 12% from food stores, and almost 60% from all the other. So this is one of the great reasons why the council approved a budget that included significant reserves. We have 19.5% reserves or $28.2 million for the general fund operating expenses. So we believe that despite the downturn, we do have reserves on hand that will help um, work us through any downturn that we have in the short term. We'll have to see how the economy bounces back um, when things begin to return to normal and whether our reserves will hold through for that, but we feel very confident that we've done a good job in, in financial planning thanks to the council's um, agreement with those reserves. So then on to the next thing. So as I think you heard we are working in partnership with a lot of agencies around the region, um, and we really appreciate all the community partners that we have. Um, Kurt talked a little bit about the funding collaborative, um, working to coordinate resident support, 
and the community vitality has already been working with our partners in that area, including the Small Business Development Center, the Boulder Chamber, the Latino Chamber, um, the county, and the Boulder Convention and Visitors Bureau. So we, th those are just examples of things that city staff members are doing. We're reaching out to all of our partners, and just like. Dr. Visser said that they're working with their hospital partners around the region. Um, when you face a crisis like this, working together always makes a difference. So we obviously are gonna be providing more updates in the days and weeks ahead, and council will make a decision about whether or not you wanna have meetings more frequently, and we can talk about that later. Um, one of the things that we're doing is we're taking a really hard look at our programs and services so that we can be ready to respond to the needs of our community. And I think that's a lot of the questions that you were asking of Kurt Fernhaber a minute ago, because we definitely want to be focusing on those who are most vulnerable in our community. So then uh, the next slide, I think, starts to work us into um, a discussion that you may have. Do we have the next slide coming up? Yeah. So um, as you know, we issued a declaration of emergency and tonight we're asking council- Unknown participant is now exiting. We're asking council to extend that and um, approve it. But we also had some orders that occurred underneath that particular emergency power. One of which was today, we issued an emergency order prohibiting gatherings of more than 20 people on public spaces in the city. That's different than what the, um, the governor did, which is 50 people, but we went to 20. Anyway, um, we've been hearing a lot about things that we could do, and so we prepared this slide to show you some options. The first one is um, no person shall allow um, in-person consumption of food and drink at any um, restaurant, bar, tavern, hotel. We would allow takeout, delivery, and drive-through. And so this is something the governor has done on a statewide basis, and we can talk to the city attorney about whether or not it would be important for us to also issue that to make it more enforceable in the city. Um, then we were also thinking about health clubs, gyms, or theaters. Again, the governor did this as well, um, and we'll need to know uh, whether or not we should legally um, also adopt it in the city. And then we tried to come up with something very broad that you can talk about um, and adopt or, or ask me to adopt or not. So this would be that any business or organization um, should not be open to the public unless they exercise good sanitation practices. So that's pretty broad. I'm not, I think it will be difficult to enforce, but we wanted just to show you an option that would show something much broader. Certainly, our community members have been writing to city council and providing you with lots of ideas. I know that you yourselves have a number of ideas that you'd like to talk about. And so I think we're ready to begin the discussion phase of this um, conversation, unless you have further questions about um, our response to the emergency. Let's do questions first and then, and then open it up for discussion. Adam, do you have a question? Yeah, just a point, because I didn't remember at the time that we were talking about CU and I don't want it to get lost. Um, it would be awesome if we could find out, is are still dining hall services open for residents? I, I believe that they will remain open for the people that are staying in the dorms. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. That, that kind of begs a, a broader question, Tom. Do you know the answer? Do we have jurisdiction over CU? In other words, if CU was doing something that we would otherwise prohibit of private parties, do you know we have jurisdiction to tell them, tell them as opposed to ask them? I've been always ask them, but tell them what to do, or is it state tell exempt? The is individual it, or the, the university? The university itself. That's one of those tough questions. I think we would have, if they were violating our laws, the, the, the ability to tell them to stop, yes. Okay. The questions before we kind of go into a broader discussion about what um, we'd like to see Jane do. Go ahead, Mark. Um, our reserves, my shaky math is near accurate, represent about two and a half months. Is that about right of, of operations? Yes, that is right. And that would be if if everything stopped, okay. and our view is that everything is not actually going to stop, but that has been one of the reasons we've been trying to push it up and up. Since we have no idea how long this is going to last or how severe it's going to be, has there been any uh, contingency planning for those things we're just going to stop doing or not fund or put off to another 
for another six months or a year until we have the capability of doing it, in effect, a doomsday list. So we did this during the 2008, uh, 2009 downturn, and we will be, as we start talking about the budget for next year, thinking about the budget for this year now and coming up with ideas, but we have not done specific planning around it so that it, it's not like tomorrow we could start shutting down yeah. stuff. We need to think about what would be appropriate to stop doing. Is it worth initiating that process of planning? Yeah, we could do so. One of the issues that we have, however, and I don't even want to call it an issue, is the requirements of federal law and our own policies with regard to paying our employees during this time. And so if we stopped a service, the only way to really save money on it would be to have employees not be working and not be paid. And we've made a policy decision to pay our employees. Which I support. Right. Thank you. Uh, um, let's go to Rachel and and oh, I, okay. Let me let's go to the the phone, people on the phone because I've been waiting patiently, and then we got um, Mary and and uh, Jenny, um, Rachel and Sam. We're just asking questions of Jane now. We'll we'll bro broaden into an yep. uh, open discussion. But you've got some questions. Okay, I do. I have a um, quick question. Thank you, Jane. That was really helpful, and I'm glad to hear that we are going to keep uh, paying employees as a policy. So uh, my question is. I, I absolutely encourage us to shop locally, but given that we are trying not to go out, I, I personally have been doing some online ordering, so I want to make sure um, to clarify for the community, does that continue to sustain our sales tax equally? I know that, online? yeah, it, it depends where you order from, I guess is the answer. Um, Amazon and other the other large ones do submit sales taxes. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Sam, do you have any questions of Jane? I do not, thanks. Okay, I think we went to Junie and then Mary. Thank you. I just have a question for some of the emails that we, see, we received about people on the Hill, and I did read the declaration, the emergency declaration, uh, when we talked about no gathering of people, of more than 20 people in public. But I think part of the issue was there were a lot of students inside their private home, and I was wondering, I don't know if that's something we can restrict people from having that many people, but because I would imagine that also impact the community. If you have 50 to 100 students just in their homes partying and then dispersing into the community, so I just wanted to have some clarification. Thank you. So I don't know if we can lawfully prohibit actions inside of homes or not. Uh, one of the reasons that we did pass this um, emergency declaration is, is to address some things that were going on on the Hill. So in the event that a party spills over into the street, then the police would be able to enforce it. And I'll, I'll tell you that they've been working really hard up on the Hill to enforce all of our rules up there. And I think they've been doing a good job of that, you know, it's hard to control what others do, but we are trying to do that. So. Mary. So um, thank you as well for the policy of continuing to pay employees. So we also have um, our custodial employees or contracts with custodial companies that um, we've done the, the minimum wage work and all of that. And so I'm wondering if those contracts cover situations such as this where um, the rec centers, for instance, are closed now. And if those folks, they may be working, I don't know, but if they are not working, is there something in the contract? Um, and if so, what might it say? Um, regarding uh, pay in situations such as this one? So Mary, I don't know the answer to that question and I don't think we know. Do I, you know? Yes, oh, I can Tanya, jump you're in. Awesome. <laughs> Um, so we are actively looking at all of our contracts in addition to janitorial um, for the reasons that you mentioned, Mary, specifically to janitorial. We are actually increasing our cleaning. So there is not an impact to our janitorial um, contracts. And frankly, we look at that as essential contracts to stay in place so that we are protecting our first responders and essential employees. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Jane, I have a question for you. Um, we, we received a number of emails over the last few days from um, community members with helpful suggestions, and one of those helpful suggestions that they've offered is, is that um, because the city owns the former Boulder Community Hospital site on Broadway, that perhaps that could be a facility that could be used either for patient overflow or quarantine or other uh, sheltering if that need ever arises. Can you speak a little bit uh, about the appropriateness of using th that building for, for, that, for those purposes? Yeah, thanks for that question, Bob. So as you all know, we've been working on that building for a long time, and a number of months ago, council authorized us to begin deconstruction of the building. And so we've started to do that in a very environmentally sustainable way. So one of the first things that we needed to do to shut down the building was to turn off all water services to the building. As a result, for months, there has not been water or sanitation services in the building. It is currently not habitable. Not only does it, does it not have a certificate of occupancy, it, it is not habitable for human life, and we cannot bring it up easily. It would, it, it's mostly impossible. There are hazardous materials, there are hazardous concerns there of black mold, which we continue to abate every time we find it, but um, it, it's just not an appropriate place to put human beings. So it is, it's not an alternative. So that's why I'm super glad that Dr. Vissers and Jeff Zayak were here earlier tonight um, and explained to us that indeed they're working on alternative care facilities and that they do have plans for that. So that we do have overflow capacity in our community through the hospital and public health working together. Great, thanks Jane. I have another question. Mary? So Jane, um, in your, one of the orders, I, I believe it was for this morning, um, it was 20 people in public um, right. spaces. And um, during Jeff Zayek's presentation, he said that it would be better if it was more like five or 10. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that was also what was um, recommended at the federal level. So I'm wondering if that can change. Yes, it absolutely can. In fact, we had an interesting conversation around what number we were going to pick, and we ended up with 20 um, because we felt 50 was way too large of a number and we weren't sure that it was appropriate to go down to 10, but it, it would certainly be appropriate for council to give some guidance on that and then we can amend that order. Well, one of the things that um, I heard during um, Jeff's presentation was that you take the number of cases and you multiply that by 50 as the number of probable cases out there, so maybe that provides some guidance. Yeah, thank you. Adam? Yeah, this is a little bit out of left field, but it's a question for Tom regarding trying to mitigate some of the partying uh, that's happening. Is, is there any enforceable way to prevent a certain amount of alcohol being purchased at a single time? Like, is there anything we can do in that term? Yes, yes, the, the, um, the emergency code provides specifically for limitations on sale of alcohol. Um, you could theoretically do that. Um, Just offering it up. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Jane before we kind of launch into a discussion about things we should do? Mary? One more. Um, I received a, a question about whether or not we might be able to do something similar to the way Amber Alerts are done. Um, in terms of anything that should go out immediately in a very broad manner. So I'm just asking the question. I, I would need to, to talk to um, Carrie Weinheimer and Mike Calderazzo for <coughs> clear information, but we do have a reverse 911. We just need people to sign up for it. And I, I don't think we've had a majority of people do so. So we can put out more information about how to, how to sign up for reverse 911 and encourage people to do that in case of emergencies. I'll just add, Jane, um, the, the police department has a really good app as well, um, which is a little different than the reverse 911, and you can opt in on that app. If you download that app and you opt in, you can opt to receive notifications from the police department. So that might be a way of communicating along the lines of what Mary's talking about. 
Okay, and, and they're, they're just information. they're just uh, texts that yeah. pop up, you know, and they're kind of like Amber Alerts. But they, when when something's going down, the police department pushes something out. It's not really nine one one, but it's just letting folks know. Great, thanks. Oh, I'm sorry, Jenny. You're sitting so far away. I know. <laughs> we're so. I know. I have two screens. We're, we're really taking social distancing to a, to a new level. Yes, I wanted to ask about eviction. Will we eventually talk about that later? Or? Yeah, we will. We're going to okay. going to focus on, on questions and and then provide Jane some some guidance and and then I think we'll wrap it up with um, a discussion of what what topics we want to talk about at future meetings and how often we want to have those. Well, it's not about future meetings. Okay, it's go ahead. More about you know in the same. Yeah framework of emergency. I, I just, if I, I think once we talk about Jane's proposals, we'll also yeah. talk about the ideas we have about what to do okay. next. Yeah. So I if you have a discussion item, we probably wait until okay, then. Okay, thank yeah. you. I, I think we're just about done with questions. Um, Rachel and Sam, do you have any follow-up questions for, for Jane before we launch into the discussion? Well, um, this is Sam. I have a whole bunch of up on the list that I think we should touch on, um, but I don't have any more uh, questions for Jane. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and move into that discussion. I got lots of discussion your questions. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, you guys have been very patient on the phone, so we'll, why don't we let you guys go first. I know, Sam, you've got a list, and it sounds like, Rachel, you've got it, and then Junie will go into uh, eviction discussions and some other things. So, Sam, uh, take it away. All right. So, um, private schools, what will we do about those? Which? James, do you, will your uh, your directive have an impact on private schools? So I don't have a directive yet. The, what I in, intended to adopt was the one with regard to restaurant takeout, delivery, and drive-through, and possibly the health club, gyms, or theaters, both of which the governor has done, and we can mirror those if we need to. But beyond that, I had not made an intention to add places. So that's why we're having the conversation to figure out what council feels would be appropriate. Let me make a, a, a process okay. su suggestion because it sounds like we might be getting into a bit of a laundry list. Jane, would you prefer that people just speak to their laundry list without you responding to it, or do you want us to take each item and have a little bit of a council poll? What would be most helpful for you? So I, so I truly can't respond to everybody's single item. Yeah. And so it, it seems like the council should talk about the things that they want, and then all of you need to come to kind of a consensus about the sorts of things that you're most concerned about. Is there any way we, I don't know who's, Chris, you're controlling the um, screen. Is there any way you could do kind of a little whiteboard exercise where you could just do some bullet points? And so maybe we could just get everyone's um, list out there and then we can go back and, and do it rather than item by item. Can you do that for us? So the first, if you could, when, when you get ready, first item was um, private schools, presumably that's other than BBSD. And, and keep in mind our jurisdiction is, is the city limits. Um, Sam, go ahead and continue with your list. We're just going to um, whiteboard this stuff, um, and, and, uh, Great. Which, and then and then um, and then we'll circle back and, and talk about what we um, we might do with it. So go ahead, Sam. Great. Well, I you know I can be brief. I sent my email in right. So it, the private schools workshop instruction facilities, which was I think Sue Prant's request. Um, any of the remaining live theaters that are open, uh, private events and festivals. Can you go a little slower, Sam? Uh, Chris is trying to Chris is trying to type as you talk, so just a little bit slower. Uh, festivals. Uh, go ahead. Sorry, I'll do it again. Private schools, workshop instruction facilities, which was Sue Prant and uh, her her interest in um, <coughs> the the. Um, facilities there. Any remaining live theaters that are open? Private events and festivals. Okay. Resource 2000 and Charm. So I think they're going to shut down voluntarily, so that may not be a big deal, but I just wanted to put that up. And then, you know, the other questions I had were, do we want to think about how we deal with groceries? Do we want to think about how we deal with pharmacies? 
and then shelters like the shelter for the homeless and you know what we're going to want to do for any of the other shelters we have uh, clinics and I can stop there I don't need to keep going but I think you all saw my email okay um, well let's just go ahead and throw everything from your email up there and, and some of them we might be able to address real quick well okay. I wonder so um, Sam can, can I just there, ask you take care tells. Sam do you, do you mind if I ask you a quick question go ahead Aaron I'm sorry Thanks. Well, I just want to, are you, do you have concrete proposals on all of these or, or do you want us to talk them over one by one? Like, um, like that's a question. Yeah. Yeah, I have concrete proposals on private schools, gyms, you know, so we, we heard from the governor. Um, yeah, I do think that we want to consider shutting down any schools which are not shut down already. Um, I think any remaining live theaters that are open, I think we want to shut them down, um, which includes movie theaters. Um, so yeah, I do, for some of these, have a concrete proposal. And then for some, I, I thought we should at least just raise the issue and talk about it, like with groceries and pharmacies and you know shelters for homeless. So, uh, Anyway, I, I'm just using my, my moment to put ideas out there and then we can figure out what to do. Um, let me make a suggestion, Sam. When you send your list out on hotline this afternoon, you, you put things in two categories, um, closures or potential closures, and then uh, the second list was really more uh, discussion items. Would you be okay if Chris kind of divided them up into those two categories? Totally. Yep. Okay. So, Chris, I, I, the, the, I think the, the closure potentials would um, um, would include uh, theaters, gyms, private schools, uh, workshop instruction facilities, live theaters, private event festivals, and resource charm. And then, if you could just you know put a heading on those that are you know potential closures, and then everything starting at grocery stores on down is more and more discussion points. Yeah, gyms goes gym goes in the top. And then, Sam, you, I think you started, you got grocery stores, pharmacy, shelters, clinics. Um, daycare, daycare, daycare centers. Okay. Yep. Hotels. Go ahead. Um, and then what did we do about offices that people might walk into? Bob, I think you, you brought up Knox and manufacturing. Um, what did we do about transit? What did we do about Uber and Lyft? And then I think we've heard enough about emergency services, but uh, you know, I, I just wanted to raise all this. So, so Chris uh, got hotels, um, offices, and manufacturing, transit, and TNC. It'd be like Uber and Lyft. Um, so those are those are really more discussion points, probably less likely to be um, points of potential closure, but just. I think I think uh, worthy of a discussion about if there's any changes or any, anything. So let's just go back to the top list of closures. Um, Rachel, do you have um, other potential? Again, this is all just potential. We're just talking out loud here to provide Jane some guidance because we don't know where we're going to meet again. Anything that w that Sam hasn't mentioned on the p potential closure list um, that you'd like to add? Um. Yeah, probably. So I sort of divided my list up differently. So I don't know how you want me to go through it, but I had like three buckets. One is proactive community help ideas. Second was we want to advocate for any like executive orders or state action to be applied during the state of emergency. And the third is city purview and decisions, which is probably ties up closest with Sam. Okay. Um, I don't know how you want me to handle it. Well, what, what, it sounds like you. If I understood you correctly, it sounds like your your second and third buckets are probably in the category. So I think what we're talking about right now is providing Jane with some direction uh, uh, for further consideration on potential closures, and then another list of things that are are maybe to be talked about. Um, uh, okay, so I'll I'll just run it through and and feel free to divvy it. It's not that long. 
So under proactive community help, I had, um, do we want grocery stores to open early and limit to special hours for people who are elderly at, at okay. risk? Um, are we working on organized delivery for things like groceries and um, uh, pharmacy items for people who are vulnerable? Are we suspending evictions, the homelessness questions such as sanitation, hand washing stations, public bathrooms, day shelter? anything else we should be looking at. Um, and do we want to maybe, I mean, it's a little bit um, inverted, but do we want to start a list of things that are staying open because we're closing so many things? Like where can you continue to get items such as groceries? Um, so that's sort of the proactive help bucket that I had. Second for executive orders, the things that we, I think are state level, but I don't know. Um, things like no penalties or interest or payment holidays on things like mortgage and student loans who would be advocating for those things, other financial protections for workers, um, protections for employees who don't want to risk going in to do non-essential work if the employers are not being supportive of social distancing, um, sort of akin to whistleblower protections in this scenario. Um, and then one question that I had sort of touched on with Tom is, is it remotely possible that we could get a, during this emergency period, only a change to CORA um, and open records that might enable us to have serial meetings and discuss things like the board appointments more efficiently via email during the shutdown? Um, also wanted to get a little bit of clarification on CORA, especially for us new members. So um, I was sort of advised not to hotline, especially about COVID-19 COVID um, to sort of avoid confusion, and so what are the exact lawful ways that I can communicate with the co-counselors if not on hotline, and wanted to get some really firm definitions around what does constitute a serial meeting while we are in this just odd moment in history. And then my third bucket was sort of city purview and decisions, so do we want to, and I, I may have not been able to hear this, but did we suspend any water shutoffs? Um, do we want to look at, uh, look at lifting the ban on prohibiting safe parking? And then to Sam's direct point of shutting down non-essential business, um, make sure that we consider that there are benefits to small businesses, it sounds like, or businesses if we mandate or force it in terms of insurance availability. Um, there was a question about can we change the tip sharing for minimum wage law? I don't know if that's state versus local for servers um, can share without having to maybe reclassify them from servers to something else because we're not going to have servers anymore. We're going to have people carrying out. Um, so we may need to tinker with that. Uh, and then apparently you cannot donate food if you've opened it. But like right now there will be opened food that is going to go to waste if we declare that people have to shut. And so can those, can we find a way for that to be donated? I don't know if we're going to talk about open space. It sounded like that is not impacted by the current order. Um, and then I didn't know if there's anything we can do to improve transit. I know that some cities are opening additional bike lanes on streets. Can we make it easier to rent e-bikes? Some of that is equity considerations. Like if, if we want people not to ride the bus, but they don't own a car, can we make it easier for people to bike? Um, are, are we gonna look at public curfews? Are we gonna look at sales tax abatements for people that are having to shut down? Um, and then there were some emails about ballot petitions. I think we could probably look at that at a later date. That's my whole list. Okay, great. Um, let, um, let's continue, just to be fair to everybody, give everyone an opportunity to add to these, effectively, what an hour, three lists. Um, and then, then let's just pause, and before we talk about any of them, let's talk a little bit about process, because because we just generated like a, a three-year work plan here, I think. Yes, you <laughs> um, and, and we're not going to do that tonight, or we probably don't have time to do that even over the next several weeks. So let's, let's just complete the list, and then let's take a step back and talk a little bit about how we want to tackle them and what's most immediate. So we really have three lists. One is things that are potential closures, things that are um, we may want to proactively support, and then um, other, I guess I'll talk to call it um, policy changes or issues like eviction, suspension, and things like that, uh, assistance type, type of thing. So that's really the, the three topics we have. So who wants to go next to potentially add to the list that um, Sam and Rachel just started? Junie, thank you. 
in the, <laughs> in the narrative. Yeah. Yes, I just wanted to add to what Rachel mentioned about the eviction, which is a possible, if it is possible, a moratorium on eviction, taking into account whether the person, the renter can bring an affidavit from their employer, as was mentioned. So not making it too broad if we have that type of a moratorium and also supporting the working class community here in Boulder. And also, um, could would it be possible to get an extension of the deadline for rental licenses? And as we mentioned earlier, can we have sanitation in public areas frequented by the homeless? I know that Kurt just mentioned there are not encampments, but if there are places still around or, or community where there are a lot of homeless people, would it be possible to have some type of sanitation system there? And also, since we're also talking about broad policy, I'm not sure if this is something we can take on now or in the future. Would it be possible to lobby the federal government for an extension of the census? Because we know right now not everyone has computer access in their home. And the library closures and, and with everything that is going on, I think that would be helpful if looking at the broad policy. So thank you. Adam? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. And then Aaron. Quick question. Um, Number two, your extension of rental licenses. Can you expand on that a little bit? I'm just yeah. not sure what you're asking. Ah, the deadline, not extension of, if someone apply for a rental license, because we know there's a lot of closures with or services, can they get an extension, basically? And Junie, are you asking, are you worried about a rental license that might be expiring um, and an extension on like a renewal for getting a rental license? Yes, yes. Um, also, I, I wanted to add to the eviction part that I forgot to mention. I know that's a lot to ask for. If, for instance, someone's already going through the eviction process, let's say they've already been through court, can we stay that, meaning that I mean, they've already been through court, they have to leave. I guess maybe there might be some mi other mitigating um, factors we can help these people with. For instance, I don't know, provide them housing. So I think that might be more of a curt question than it is anything else, so thank you. I have a follow-up on that. Um, to what extent does the, clo the suspension of non-essential cases at district and county court affect evictions? It's hard to say. Uh, I would guess that the court would not consider those essential cases, so that they're probably not handling them. Um, in Colorado, eviction is a state, is a matter of state law. Um, you, you, so, uh, they, it's it's not something that we can prohibit. Um, so I would think that it's unlikely that a court's going to take up a case, but. Again, I, I, the court hasn't announced exactly what it's doing yet, so I'd be hesitant to give you an opinion on how that's going to affect those cases. So maybe the question here would be, um, if the suspension of non-essential cases um, at the, the county and um, district court levels does not um, suspend eviction, then what can be done? I'm not sure, Mary, that the, you know, so the state law provides for the right for a landlord to evict somebody in a process for doing that. Uh, we can't, I don't think we have the authority to order the state not to follow its own process. We could try to order the landlords not to use it, but I think we, that's not a very strong position because they have that right under state law. So I'm not quite sure how we would do it. I think Kurt's approach has been to more in, in, use city resources to prevent people from getting in that situation rather than trying to interfere with the process itself. Um, so, but the question stands is, what is covered or not covered by the... Yeah, and, and we will report to you as soon as we hear from the okay, court. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, Adam and then Aaron. Yeah, and Mark. I'll throw up my out limiting alcohol sales just for fun. Um, we'll see if there's anyone who is interested. Obviously, you could go right outside the town of Valium, however much alcohol you wanted, but it's at least an option. Did you're you're, you're going to be a real popular guy. I know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Always wanted to be popular. Outlawed. 
Not out loud, just uh, limiting Limit. Limit. total sales okay. I thought uh, I heard out loud. Per, per person. Okay, add that to the list. Aaron? Okay, well, I, um, I had a shorter list. They've pretty much all been brought up, but I'll just real quickly go through them just to asterisk and interest. And there was about um, eviction prevention, uh, not necessarily a moratorium, but how can we make sure that people aren't kicked out of uh, their homes at this um, time of public health crisis? Uh, so that's a rental support thing is one aspect of that. Uh, also, small business support, you know, what we as a city can do um, to help support the small businesses that will be struggling during um, with some of these uh, restrictions and closures and things like that. Um, the sanitation, particularly the hand washing facilities that I mentioned before. One thing that's probably easy for us is to not do um, utility shutoffs of city water. So that seemed like a potential measure we could take. Um, and then support for uh, the essential businesses, that's that proactive bit that, that Rachel mentioned, like uh, pharmacies and grocery stores, like how do we make sure that they have city support or th are there ways we can facilitate some assistance for them? And like I've heard some the grocery stores are starting off with an hour for uh, seniors in the morning, you know, maybe can we s recommend something like that? So that's my short list. Great, Mirabai? Oh, I'm sorry, will you next, Mark? Mark and then Mary. I'm, uh, uh, I am hopeful that the courts will um, not process evictions, but I, I would, I'm afraid we're going to be engaged in some magical thinking here because if evictions are halted for 90 days or 60 days or 120 days, if the people in those apartments are not working, they're going to be evicted on the 91st day. Um, and so I would want to consider whether we can find any resources to augment rental assistance um, so that people can actually stay in their apartments. Otherwise, uh, we're, uh, we're delaying the, the day of reckoning, but it's going to be a huge day of reckoning. Um, I also want to focus a little bit on evictions of commercial tenants. Um, you know, in, in we often look to other cities for best practices. Well, in, in New York, some of the leading uh, real, uh, real estate firms have banded together to commit not to have evictions for another 90 days. Um, and if we can encourage our uh, landlord community to work with tenants to find a way to keep them in place, um, I think that would be good. Um, they may do that on their own because at the end of 90 or 120 days from now, there may be no tenants to be had if they evict somebody. But um, uh, I, I would like to find other forms of assistance for residential tenants because without it, um, we just, you know, uh, putting off the day of reckoning. Great. Everybody? Um, I, of course, am on board with the evictions, for both for business and um, individuals. Um, the one thing, I, I mean, the list is obviously extremely long. The one thing I guess I would bring to this and try to have, have us remember is that though we are fighting um, a disease, the longer impact is going to be our economy, our budget, and all of the individuals that are involved. So when we start limiting sales of alcohol, that's now the clerk that's, you know, the clerk that's handling that, that's the business itself, and that's our tax dollars not receiving those. So maybe instead of as many closures as we're talking about, because I mean, we've received a number of emails and I've received a lot of private emails asking me, please don't shut us down. And some of it's out of our control, obviously, the governor did that already. Um, but maybe trying to figure out ways of shopping um, in a safe manner that will still allow income to come in and people to be employed. Um, but I mean, this, the drastic effects this is possibly gonna have on everyone. I mean, everyone's being touched by it. Uh, and it's, that's truly what's terrifying me. So just while we're having this discussion of closing everything down, keep that in mind if you can. Okay. Let me make a process suggestion, Jane, that you can react to. We've got a really, really long list here. Um, some of them are, are, may provide some direction to you. Others will undoubtedly involve some staff work. If we can go back, to, scroll back to the top of the list, um, um, and focus on those things. Let, let's assume for sake of discussion that we're going to meet, we as a council are going to meet in, in a week or two. Um, and we can give Jane's team a little bit of time to, um, a little bit of time, to come back on some of these things. Um, some of them may require even more. Some of them may be in flight. Um, but um, 
are there, we've got really four or five things um, into the closure category, some of which have probably have already been addressed by the governor. It sounds like Tom's going to go off and, and, and take a look at those carefully and determine whether we need to, you know, belt and suspenders do our own declaration. But just focusing on those five or six that are under the potential closure category, let's focus on maybe those for purposes of providing staff direction tonight. And then let's give staff a few weeks to, um, to to come back to us on some of the other things. Does that work for you, Jane? Yes, it does. Okay. So, yeah, Mary. So, um, with respect to this, as we move into it, um, I have a question um, about the insurance thing that I brought up this morning. Uh, was that this morning? Yeah. Um, one of the things I've learned um, is that the is that potentially if people close before the mandate that they won't be covered so i'm wondering um and this doesn't have to be answered right now is might it be possible to backdate the mandate so that people that close say on friday would be covered just a question okay let, let me suggest that we kind of park. The, I think the insurance question is a really open question, and I think some of us are a little skeptical about this, and maybe it's right and maybe it's wrong, or maybe it depends on what policy you have or who your insurer is. So let me suggest for purposes of this discussion, we focus on health and safety, and in following the advice that we've got from Boulder County Public Health and from Dr. Vissers, we focus on what should be closed that's not already been closed by the governor or by us already, and just make those determinations based on public health. And if that happens to help somebody from an insurance standpoint, that's fine, and, 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 and maybe it won't anyway. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So let's take private schools. Um, do, do, we, do we even know the status of private schools, whether they're open or closed? I don't know okay. them. What, what's your reaction to that, Jane? If, to the extent that they're in the city and they haven't already closed, do you? Um, yeah, my reaction is that they should be closed. Okay, D does council agree with Jane's recommendation there? Rachel and Sam, just shout out if you disagree with what's being said. Yeah. Okay. Bob, I wonder if the governor's mandate um, prohibiting assemblies of more than 50 people affects that. <coughs> Could very well. So, so, yeah. Go ahead, Sam. So, so Bob, this Sam, can we, can we roll back a little bit and say, Restaurants and bars um, will we allow curbside and uh, delivery? Well, I think that's what the I think that's what the governor's order says. Yeah. We'll 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 confirm that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then um, marijuana retail and general retail. How are we going to deal with that as far as like allowing uh, curbside or are we just going to shut them? Well, um, okay, let's, let's just go. I know you don't have the benefit of seeing the whiteboard, but let's, we'll add retail, um, including marijuana, to the list of potential closures, and we'll get to that. <laughs> let's just maybe go through methodically. Bob. Okay. Yep. Great. Could, could I just add something? Yep. In, in the discussions we had over the weekend on what we should do and shouldn't do, yep. one of the things that weighed he heaviest was the capacity of the police department to enforce the things that we did. So as you think these through, think about the effect it would have and the priority. And none of us are public health experts, so I, I can't tell you whether there's a greater risk, whether somebody walks into a store and picks something up or stands on a curb and picks something up. There may be some logic, but th that's one of the things we struggled with all weekend long was how far we should go and then what burden you're placing on an already overtaxed police department uh, for and what benefit you're getting from imposing that burden. So as you as you walk through those, I'd appreciate if you could just keep those thoughts in mind. It may be self-evident, but I wanted Great. to say it. Thanks. So it sounds like we've got private schools, we've got thumbs up. To the extent that they're not already um, self-closed, we've got that. And it sounds like Jane recommends we do that. Um, workshop instruction facilities, I guess this is a kind of a general category of, of, of places like community cycles and studio arts and other places where the gathering may be, the, the governor's limit was 50, is that right? Yeah. So th this would obviously anything that has more than 50 people to gather together would be banned anyway. So this would be for the things that have less, fewer than 50 people. Um, Jane, do you have a recommendation on this one? If we can define instructional facilities, I think that's a little tricky, but I, I don't have a problem with this one. Council members? 
If I can just, so gyms were part of the governor's, and I guess we don't, we haven't seen the actual order yet, so we're, we're not 100% sure of exactly what it includes. That's right. Well, but to the extent that you had a, an instructional facility that was like a, a yoga shop, it probably is a gym. Um, where, you know, a cycling place probably isn't, so. Um, so would it be like ballet studios? Don't know. So you might want to consider just taking what the governor did and lowering the number. So. How do folks feel about that? I mean, we, we've already got a number of 20 on public places. We're not talking about private places. And of course, we heard from Jeff and about Dr. Vissers, that, or at least Jeff, that suggested we think about something closer to 10. So that we could short circuit this discussion and, and talk about gatherings of more than X number of people, and we wouldn't have to go into categories. Because undoubtedly, if we go through categories, we're going to forget about some and we're going to regret that. Mary, do you have a comment on that? Well, I, had, you know, with respect to um, like live theater, um, most of the live theater occurs at the dairy, um, and that closed last week. Um, festivals, a lot of the festivals occur in um, public spaces, and so we're limiting that to 20. So I, I think some of these are already covered by virtue of where they occur. I think you're right, absolutely right. I think we're just, this is maybe a, 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 maybe a sweep up of anything that might not be covered. No might not already be closed on their own initiative or may not be covered by existing orders. I think we're just trying to be comprehensive here. That's a good question. Yeah, Aaron. So, Jane, your, your order uh, restricting gatherings to 20 people or fewer, my understanding of that was that it was on publicly owned spaces. That's Did I, correct. Right? Yes. So that's different from uh, like a theater, you know, or, right, a privately owned space, right? Yeah. So, right. Right. So just want to be clear, I, I think the governors may include private gatherings, but I don't know. We're Actually, we just received the order. Ah. So it, it says movie and performance theaters, opera houses, concert halls, and music halls are all to be closed. But how about the other categories? I think there were... So it's restaurants, food courts, cafes, coffee houses, and other similar places of public accommodation offering food or beverages, bars, taverns, brew pubs, breweries, microbreweries, distillery pubs, wineries, tasting rooms, special licenses, clubs, and other places of public accommodation offering alcoholic beverages for on-premise consumption, cigar bars, gymnasiums, movie and performance theaters, opera houses, concert halls, music halls, and casinos. Okay. I just want to remind everybody, anybody that's watching that this or this governor had a press conference at 4.30 this afternoon, so this is only about less than three hours old, and Tom just got the order, so we're kind of working in real time here. Yeah, Mayor Bai. Tom, does there, is there anything in there, though, about the 50? I think that was an earlier order. I'll, I'll look for that. Okay. Yeah. Because that would answer a lot of our yeah. questions. Then, right. right. Okay. So given, let's assume for sake of discussion that, that I, think, I think the governor did have an order over the weekend that banned more than 50 people gathering together. But in public or and private, that's where yeah. the... Yeah, it covered both. both. I think it covered both. Right. So let's assume that, that that's the case, and, is, and you just heard Tom's list of what came out a few hours ago. So I guess the question is, is there anything else, we talked about private schools, is there anything else that wouldn't be covered by the statewide bans and more than 50 people together, or the laundry list that Tom just read? Well, I, I will just note that, um, that Jeff Syak of, from County Public Health felt like th he did not see a need for additional restrictions beyond what the governor just ordered today. Okay. So that's our County Public Health Authority. Uh, but I think Dr. Vissers was recommending 10, was he not? Five to 10. Five to 10. Um, I think that was the public, in public, like on public property was what we were talking about for that. Sorry, Rob. I, well, I may have heard it wrongly. I, I, I did not hear it distinguished that in terms of public property. Um, and I would follow the medical advice. Well, let me, um, let me suggest we take this a slightly different direction. I, I'm, I, I keep thinking about McGuckins. Mm -hmm. McGuckins probably on any given day has more than 50 people in yeah. the building, right? But they provide a pretty essential service for us. Jane had, uh, and I don't know, maybe Chris, you can throw the slide back up, had a proposal at the beginning of her, of her presentation that rather than trying to, to go through and identify types of businesses or not, not necessarily even number of people is actually have a best practice requirement about distancing and, and sanitization and maybe that would maybe that would cover anything that's not already been covered by the governor's prior orders. It's that third bullet point there. Well, using the McGuckins example, 
how are you going to keep the customers from walking up to the salespeople? I mean, it, it's, I'm not sure who's going to enforce it. Right. Well, that's Tom's point about policing and enforcing. I mean, I think, you know, I think we have to recognize that we have, there's limits to our authority. I think there are probably some things, and the governor's actually taking care of a lot of that uh, heavy lifting for us, that um, um, probably requires some prescriptive action. And then uh, there's probably a whole broad category of strongly suggested, strongly suggested that you stay home, strongly suggested that you only go out when you absolutely need to, strongly suggest that you wash your hands. We're probably not going to pass a law that says you must wash your hands every hour, but we can strongly suggest that. And so I think, um, I think Jane's, you know, Jane's third bullet point really probably falls in the category of strong suggestion. We're probably not going to identify every possible behavior that some of us would say is not um, the smartest behavior. And, and we, we have to trust people to make um, decisions based upon the information we provide them. Hey, Bob, can so, I um, colloquy on that a little bit? Sure, go ahead. I, I got um, Rachel, then <laughs> Sam, and then Junie. Uh, sorry, this is Rachel. Yep. Um, I think in terms of, of not being able to anticipate everything and not being able to micromanage everything, um, I, I'm sort of seeing our role as, I think it's correct, that we are advising Jane tonight, but I have a, a pretty full faith that she is out ahead of the curve and making very strong, proactive decisions on behalf of the community. So I, I feel like we could sort of be here all night talking through individual points, but the reality is we're in really good hands with Jane, and I would, I'd be interested in understanding what questions she has from us and how we can help her. Um, otherwise, I, I'm, you know, I think we might micromanage this into next Thursday. Uh, I, I agree with that completely, Rachel. I think we're not making any decisions tonight. We're not passing any, any ordinances or making any motions on this. We're just providing, we don't know we're going to get back together again with Jane. We want to provide Jane with some ideas, some thoughts, some suggestions, some direction, um, but we're going to leave it. Jane has the authority under the order, which we're going to extend here in a few minutes. Um, to um, to make these decisions, and so I think Jane's listening very actively, and Chris and Tanya are taking really good notes, and um, and I think you're absolutely right, Rachel. We're not we're not deciding this thing, and we probably can get pretty far into the weeds, and we probably should avoid that. Sam. Yeah, and so my thought, I agree with Rachel. Um, I, I think that what we need to do is to have daily updates from. Um, our, our city leadership. So I think that Jane should continue putting out her, her emails to, to council. I think that we need to make sure that our website has everything that folks need. Um, you know, so our, our role, as Rachel said, is getting the best information out. And so I think that we want to break that down into two buckets. You know, what do we need for residential health? And then what do we need for business help? Um, and then I think one thing that we do need to decide tonight is what are we going to do for future meetings? Like, so are we going to meet every week? Um, you know, how, how are we going to do that um, going forward? Um, I, I'll also say that I thought the call with CBSD and CU today was super helpful. And I think CU Boulder uh, updating us was super helpful. And I think having the call with um, ECH was super helpful. So I would just put out there that I think we need to just make sure that we're coordinating with our partners. Okay, let's go to Junie, and then and then I think Rachel had a good suggestion, which is we should ask Jane what more she needs from us tonight. So I think I just wanted to add to the discussion because you were talking about retail stores, magoking, and I was thinking, okay, what is a retail store? And I quickly looked up that Target is, is a retail store. And when we think of magoking, how about Safeway? But we also have to consider that, for instance, in some of these places do have pharmacies. So we have to consider the health of people. So if you want to shut down retail stores and you shut down magoking, and they send us an email that they also you know, provide services to some of the safety uh, people in our community. So I think these things that we have to weigh in the balance, and also Safeway has pharmacies, Targets, I do believe they also have a pharmacy. So when we are thinking of the closures, I think we also have to think about what Mayor Bai was talking about. 
as well. Great, thanks. Great point, Jane. What um, I know we've 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 talked about a lot, but what um, let's assume that we're going to get back together in a week or two, and we'll decide that in a second. What more do you need from us tonight? This was just um, brainstorming, um, talking about some of the priorities and issues that council is thinking about. Do you need anything more from us tonight? I don't, though I do want to say to you um, what I think about shutting down general retail, and I think that would be inappropriate at this time. So I, I want you to know that any order that I do won't include that unless you affirmatively tell me that you want it to. So that will not happen from me. I, I don't hear it from anybody on council. Good. Yeah, so no one's in favor of shutting down general retail for a whole lot of reasons. So. Right. So the, the ones that you've mentioned tonight, I think we can work up an order on those. And um, obviously tonight we won't be doing the order, but maybe tomorrow and we'll let you know. Okay. Jane, can I just add to yes. that? Yes. Um, Chris is actually going to be putting up the language of the governor's order on the screen. We were able to get that so that you can see it in writing. Okay. And if you can email that to us when you get a chance, please. Okay. Email as well would be helpful, please. I'll, I'll forward it right now. Okay. And then I, Tom had something to say, and I think I saw Mary's hand up too. I just wanted to clarify that the, the governor has ordered limitations on gatherings of 250 people. It 250. was Denver that did 50. Okay. That's the CDC's recommendation. The state has not done that yet. Okay. Mary? Yeah, one additional thing that, thing that I think would be um, something that council members would do and maybe a subcommittee of council members to put together a declaration um, that considers um, things like um, asking landlords to work with their tenants and, um, and then maybe some language about considering where we shop when we shop. Um, just things that can't be covered by mandates, but that um, council members can, as um, community members, um, strongly encourage um, other community, community members to, um, to carry out. Great. Um, I think that's a great suggestion. I guess the question is, is uh, and we can bring that resolution back at an at a, a, a upcoming council meeting. It would be a declaration. De excuse me, declaration, um, non binding declaration. Is that something, Jane, that your staff could put together having heard this conversation? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so we may not may not need a, a council. I mean, maybe a, okay. a draft would no, be no, that's fine. circulated and council members can weigh in. I was in just it. trying yeah. to be. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a great idea. Okay. And just for clarification, it's great that we have the governor's order. We will probably mirror that by our order. We'll also say the things that the governor's order says, just to make sure that we are 100% sure that we can enforce it. So we've got a particular code provision that allows our police department to enforce local orders. So we will mirror that and possibly add some of the things we've also discussed tonight. Great. And the only suggestion I would make to that, Jane, is when we issue the press release on that order, presumably tomorrow, we, we make it clear that, that we're mirroring the order. That, in other words, that we're not initiating this. We may, we may have initiated it, but we didn't have that opportunity. The governor beat us to the punch that we're mirroring the governor's order that was previously issued statewide. Absolutely. Okay. Just one more thing to add to that declaration, which would be um, to consider the number of people at your private parties. Sure. Okay. Anything else? I think we're going to get back together again soon, and we'll talk about that in a second. Anything else for purposes of direction to Jane on that needs to get tackled in the next, call it week to two weeks? Okay. Great. So, Tom, I think you need us to make a motion to, to tell us what you need us to do. To uh, confirm and extend the city manager's uh, emergency declaration. Okay, and that extension is indefinite. That would be my recommendation, although you can put a time on it. Okay. Um, we don't have an actual um, language in front of us. We just would make a motion along the, the lines. The language is in the motion. It just, okay. it's, it's, it's in your agenda. It's just a motion to, uh, to uh, I'm sorry, a motion to, to. It's 2C. Yeah, extended until further notice declaration of local emergency signed March 14, 2020. Do we have a motion to that effect? Can I just ask a quick, quick question? So I'm, I'm fine with the indefinite, but I assume that if we wanted to rescind that at some point, we could do that at any properly Absolutely. noticed council meeting, right? Yes. Okay. And so could the city manager. 
if, if it had, if suddenly everything got better, uh, you could rescind it. And all, and as a, we'd also want to rescind all the orders issued. Thanks. Do you have a question or a motion? Motion. Okay, make it. So moved. Do we second? Mary made the second. Any further discussion? Rachel and, and, and Sam, do you have any discussion on this point? No. Mark? I. Okay. No. Mark, you have a. Yeah, uh, I just want to address the, um, I guess, the reporting aspect of this. How are we going to do this so that we're up to date on everything that, that's being done? We. We provide daily updates to council. Is there something additional? No, but the, they will be continuing to come on a daily basis then? Yes. Okay. And, and all of the orders are posted on our website so that the community can see what we've done under the decree. Do we have the legal authority if we see an order we're not happy with to amend at our next meeting? Yes. You Well, you could you'd bring it back and have a discussion about the appropriateness of the order and okay thank you any, any further discussion on the motion okay is this a roll call or a show of hands okay um rachel and and um sam we're going to ask you if you support this is not a roll call do you support the motion that adam made support it this is sam i yep as a yes rachel is that a yes yes Okay, and the rest of us in the room, show of hands. Mary, are you in favor of this? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it looks to be unanimous. Okay, great. Can we go ahead. Can I just say, Jane, thank you for stepping up and doing this a few days ago. I was really appreciated you taking the initiative on that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Really, the community needed it. And I want to I want to thank all of staff and just the tremendous amount of work that was done in such a short amount of time um, over the weekend and just the diligence. It's it's pretty amazing yeah I think thanks for mentioning that Mary and all of you I mean our staff really stepped up early last week to create the response teams that Tanya was talking about and just everybody really pitched in over the weekend and and, and last week as well and you know we're asking a lot of people to work from home and there has been compliance with that and people eager to step in and help we have a great great employee base and I just appreciate all they're doing. And I also really want to call out our frontline workers, our police officers, our firefighters, um, our utility workers, um, the people that are working on transportation, and then just in our community, the grocery workers, yeah. um, the public health workers, the nurses, e everybody in this community is really stepping up, and we are so lucky to live here. You're here. Great. We have, I think, three thing, three more things to do, which I don't think will take long. Um, one is, uh, next is item number three, which is our consent agenda. Um, I'll just be a way of background, and then um, if, if Lynette, you need to read them off, um, we can. You don't need to? Okay. Sorry. Newbie. Um, the reason why the consent agenda is on here is there were a couple of items on the consent agenda that had already been scheduled for tomorrow night that were time sensitive. And CAC talked about this morning, and, and rather than cherry pick, certain things off the consent agenda and then leave other things behind for later discussion. We just moved the entire consent agenda from tomorrow night to tonight. Some are time critical, some are not, um, but we have a motion to um, adopt or uh, approve the items on the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion on items A through G on the consent agenda? Okay, sounds like no discussion. Is this a roll call? No, show of hands. So again, this is a show of hands, Rachel and um, Sam. Could you indicate just um, verbally whether you um, uh, are voting yes for the consent agenda? My hand is up, yes. Sam, yes. Okay, the rest of us in the room, show of hands. That's unanimous also. Okay, great. Um, we already handled item 4A on boards and commissions. Um, I want to come back to that in a second. Um, we need a motion to cancel tomorrow's um, regular city council meeting. I have a motion on that. So moved. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, is that also show of hands? Okay, um, Sam and uh, Rachel, are you in favor of that? Yes. 
Same as yes. Okay, show of hands in the room. Okay, that's unanimous, so the meetings for tomorrow is canceled. Now, final item, I think, is discussion of um, future meetings. Our next scheduled meeting is April 7th. We now have the um, ability to um, dial in for um, discussions. CAC will be meeting every Monday, so we'll, we'll meet again um, next Monday, right now in rotation, uh, in addition to Sam and, and, and me is um, Adam. And um, so next Monday, we'll talk about the agendas for the next couple, two, three meetings. Um, uh, let me just rattle through a couple things that I think that we probably need to talk about, and, and you all have some things you probably want to add to that list, and then let's talk about how often we want to meet. Um, we uh, deferred boards and- Can I just ask a question really quick on CAC meeting every week? Which is just, you know, we have, um, rotations that seems like they're numerically lined up like we each get six of them and if we meet weekly then we should probably hasten the rotation so it's not the same three people this whole time okay well we can leave it to diane to decide if she wants to make some adjustments on that just yeah. for note i have no problem doing it every monday okay from that point of view CAC is normally every Monday, except when we're, we only added one CAC meeting. We were already going to have one on March 30th, so we really only added one. And Adam said he doesn't mind doing the extra meeting. Okay. So my list of th some things that we might talk about over the next few weeks: we have to do our board and commission appointments. Um, I like Mary's suggestion that we try to do that as soon as possible while things are still fresh in our minds. Um, I think we have some work plan adjustments to talk about, um, and it, we just added to our workload. Um, with this laundry list that we put together this evening, and then we have the stuff that we were already going to do in April and May and June. And so I think we need to probably have a session where we talk about um, prioritization. Um, it would probably be helpful to get some more reports from, some additional reports from CU, from BBSD, from Boulder County uh, Public Health, from Boulder Community Hospital, um, from Kurt. Um, additional briefings from staff like we did tonight and, and perhaps some more requests for direction. Uh, financial impacts to individuals and businesses. The declaration that Mary uh, suggested. Um, we might have a little bit more visibility on financial impacts to the city or if we don't, at least we could talk about our contingency plans. What if, what if sales tax went down by 2%, 5%, 10%? So we might have Katie or Cheryl come in and talk about um, what we would do once we start seeing those impacts. Um, other things that you folks think that we should try to tackle over the next couple, two, three weeks, then we can talk about the frequency of meetings. Yeah, Mary. So I had brought up um, on, no, it wasn't hotline, it was CAC, I sent it, um, about developing a plan B for our work plan. Um, so maybe that's an item for discussion at one of our meetings or, um, and what I was suggesting on that is that we, um, while we are, um, not meeting in person, that we have items that need to get done that maybe don't require um, public hearings so that we can keep moving on some items, but do it um, virtually. Right, and that's, that's great. And one, one thing I forgot on the list is um, the library district question, which we were supposed to tackle tomorrow night, we need to reschedule that as well. Uh, Mark, anything to add to that list? I mean, th th no one's cut off from future discussion about this, and please, if you think of things, send send it to CAC, but anything else you think we should tackle over the next two or three weeks? No, I think you've got it. Mirabai? Okay, Aaron? Uh, nothing to add, but I just encourage CAC as you look uh, going forward to postpone things that are, don't have an urgency, sen time sensitivity to them. I think we probably want to stay focused on the matter at hand and only deal with things that have a fair amount of time sensitivity to And that's, that's a great point. Does council mind if, uh, I'm see, if something seems to be pretty obvious to CAC, CAC certainly can do that, but there may be some things that we may want to bring back to council. In other words, we may make a recommendation that we, we deprioritize something or move it down the calendar, but we may not feel fully empowered to do that. So if, if it's okay with you, we may put some things on the list for council's blessing to defer. Great, yeah, great okay. idea. Adam? My only thing, and we already talked about it a little bit, but is um, making sure we address what peti petitioners are going to sure. doing. Mm -hmm. And that should be pretty timely since that is a pretty gray area. Great. Let's add that to the list. And, and, and Adam, you're referring to the two petitions that are out there right now and the time frame they've got to deal with? Correct. Okay. Junie, yeah, other things to add to the list? 
Nothing to add to the list that is urgent and immediate, but I think because we are charting new territories that eventually we need to look at cybersecurity contingency plan for the city. Okay. Eventually. Okay. Um, Rachel, other things to add to the list of things to tackle in the next couple, two, three weeks? Nope. Sam? No, I don't think so. <clears throat> um, I just want to make sure that we will continue to meet with our partners going forward. So, and, and I also want us to brief all of council on what we learned with those partner meetings. Great suggestion. Jane or Tom, anything, uh, deputies, anything else that you think we need to, I know that's a long list already. <laughs> you probably don't want to add to it. You good? Yeah, we're good. Okay, so that, I'm just gonna throw a proposal out. That feels to me like we need um, weekly meetings. We were not scheduled to meet on Tuesday the 24th or Tuesday the 31st. How do folks on council feel about that? A thumbs up from Adam and Aaron. Thumbs up over here. Mirabai is kind of like not really happy about it, but we're willing to. Um, <laughs> Rachel and, and, and Sam, how do you feel about meeting the next two Tuesdays? I, I think we're talking we need about to. meeting remotely, right? Re meeting remotely. Sorry, Sam. Yeah, I support it. Okay. Yeah, no, I think we need to. I think we have um, all kinds of business impacts that we're gonna only start to appreciate. And I think that we have things like the eviction issue and you know to to continue to monitor what's going to happen with our hospital so yeah i think we need to stay on top is council okay with um because normally our packets come out on thursday or friday for a tuesday meeting and we've given staff a long list of eight or ten or twelve things that we would like to tackle over the next couple two three weeks is is council okay with Jane and her team prioritizing which things we'll tackle on March 24th versus March 31st? Because CAC won't meet again until the day before that meeting, and we'll need to have that meeting agenda published by then. So, is everyone okay with Jane deciding what we're going to do on which days? Lots of noddings of heads. Yep. Okay. So Jane. I am. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And you won't have materials on Thursday, right? <laughs> so you're going to be getting them at the last minute again. Of course, of course. I apologize. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Could I, I add one caveat. Um, this is a very fast-changing situation. I, I will tell you that every meeting we I've been in, and I haven't been in all of them, it, it's been just different. And I remember from the flood, sometimes events overtake you, and you have to give us leave to not have a meeting if. <laughs> I mean, is now exiting. Particularly the three folks around me who do an awful, an amazing amount of work. Um, if they're, if they have to do things to preserve the public health, I think. I mean, although council meetings are important, public health and safety is going to come first. And nobody in our who's alive today has ever gone through this. So I can't tell you what tomorrow has is going to be like. I can tell you the last week was not how I anticipated it was going to go, um, and. It, it, it's likely to get much worse really quickly. So I just with that caveat, it's important that you work it done and that you meet, but there is a strain on staff, particularly these three, that um, may, their resource, their, their efforts may be better devoted towards public health and safety rather than arranging for a council meeting and getting materials okay. and things together. So with that caveat, or do you want to yeah, no, I think that's totally fair, Tom. And just keep in mind, too, that we could always do a 20-minute meeting, too, that, that we could assemble via conference call, and you all could give us a really quick update and say, you know what, that's all we had time for. Absolutely. Well, that's all we need it from you. Yeah, right, exactly. And so we don't, if you don't need us to help you do urgent work for the community, then, you know, we don't need to be there. And what, I have a question about, um, so next week is the fifth Tuesday? And I would imagine that there were already sort of. It's actually the, the fourth, Tuesday. fourth Tuesday next week is 24th. Oh, Tuesday is the fifth. 31st is. Follow, the, the, the 31st is the, the yeah. fifth Tuesday. So there were probably already um, some um, plans to count on that night off in terms of um, staff working. So I'm wondering um, if that could continue to be an off day. Um, 
I, as I recall, Tanya's presentation had something about weekly videos or something, and maybe some of that communication, because what I'm sensing is that part of the having the weekly meetings is about continuing to make contact with the public, and maybe there's other ways that we can do that, like through these videos or some other way that um, that does isn't as um, disruptive to keeping our eye on the the public health and safety ball. Okay. Well, well, how about this as a suggestion? Um, when staff sits down with CAC on Monday the 23rd, they can not only lay out the agenda for the 24th, but they can also tell us whether they think we should have a meeting on the 31st. Are you okay with that? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. And, and so, uh, this Sam? Sorry, Sam? I was going to bring up. I was going to bring up the idea that we had discussed um, previously of uh, having an update by the mayor on Wednesdays and rotating council members on Fridays, you know, just some way to humanize um, the, the, the kind of really contentious and very, you know, unhappy period that we're going through. How can we have, like, the fireside chat that FDR did? Um, and so. That's just one idea. I don't think we've touched on that yet, but. Is that something you want to bring back to us at a, a next uh, upcoming meeting, Jane? Yes, we, we can do that. Um, I know that Patrick, our communications director, has been working with me and Tanya and Chris and Sam, and I think, Bob, you also were aware that we might be able to start doing videos as early as this week. Okay. So we'll continue to see if we can plan to do that, and if not, we'll talk about it next week. Okay, great. Anything else? Um, you saw how difficult it was with two people on the phone. I think it's gonna be even more difficult with nine people on the call. Um, I don't know, you know, this is maybe something for you, Chris, if, if there's some way we can see each other's faces, video or something like that, it's just really, really hard to know who's talking and, and, and um, so to the extent there's a t technology solution out there that's going to help us all talk to each other, um, that would be helpful. Yeah, we have some ideas that we can work through with council members. Okay. Yeah, I'll just point out if, if you, there are a lot of services out there that have things like the virtual hand raising, you know, that say you want to indicate that you want to say something. So. <laughs> The, can I say the university, they use Zoom, Zoom, and we've been using it for about two weeks, and let me tell you, it's the greatest thing. Okay, there you go, quite an <laughs> endorsement. Okay, well, hopefully we'll have, be able, be able to see each other at our next meeting, even though we won't be in the same room. Okay, anything else? Be safe, everybody. We're adjourned. Adam Swedlick is now exiting. <laughs> Swedlick has left the building. Patrick von Kaiserlin is now exiting.